<coughs> okay. Let me move my. We are arranging some of things. Like a couple of minutes later, we are gonna going to we are going to start. Okay. I see you still have your scarf on, Guido. Is it cold in Sicily? Uh, yeah, no, I am. I, I am taking paracetamol to, <laughs> to, to, to join. You know, I'm sorry. a bit of flu, so maybe oh, my plasma bovis is not. Is Umit there, Mehmet? Umit is should be here. Let me try to check. Hande is Hande, Hande. Yes, Hande is here. No, no, no. Oh, Hande, I know Hande. Let, let me ask them. I know Hande. <laughs> Mehmet, uh, is Umit Hanum over there? Uh, she was, I think she. Hello, Robin. Oh, Andy. Hi. Hi there. Hi. 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 Nice How are you? Ahmed. Yeah, very well. <laughs> You're all looking the same. Very nice. <laughs> My computer uh, hasn't got camera. Or, or, so uh, we are. We are together. Ah, you yes. are the boss. Andy yes. is the boss. Okay. <laughs> How is life in Pendic? Busy. It is good now. They are busy. I am yeah. making their life busy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and how are you, Robin? Yeah, very well. Of course, uh, life is a little slower for me nowadays. I, I, oh. uh, I don't work in the lab as much, but uh, I do some lecturing and things. So uh, uh, I missed uh, Istanbul. I, I want to come back. <laughs> yes, we'll be happy to host you. Yeah, oh, good. Okay. <laughs> when it gets warmer. Yeah. Sure. Ciao, uh, Yumit. Nice to meet you. Ciao. Nice to meet you. You both guys. Oh, man. Hi. Nice to meet you. I miss you so much. <laughs> it's great to see you here. Yes. I'm going to. I think we are done. Uh, we can start if you are ready. Okay. Uh, Fatma Nur, başlayabiliriz. Hocam sesim geliyor mu? Evet. Okay. Dear participants, welcome to our webinar. We organized this webinar to make more attention for mycoplasma bovis infection in calves. Just keep in mind, we would happy to take any questions about presentation when you put in the chat box. I will ask those questions to each speaker, each speaker at the end of the speech. Today, we have two valuable invited speakers. Before I start with them, I would like to give the opening speech to Dr. Mehmet Cemal Yodugüzel to explain the importance of the webinar and mycoplasma bovis infection in Turkey. Uh, thank you so much, Fatma. Let me try to share my presentation. It is a very short presentation. No, 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 that one.
Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for everyone and who are listening right now. And thank you so much for Robin and Guido for accepting and our invitation. Uh, I would like to give some information, Mycoplasma Bovis, and why we are organized this meeting, why we are bringing these people together. And uh, let me start with my short presentation. Here, I would like to show you some pictures from my university on the right side. And also, you can see some picture from my city where I live, named in Erzurum, and which is very uh, Uh, very far away from Istanbul. This is because in Eastern part, we have a mountain. You can see there is a winter holiday. Uh, I would be happy to host you all when you want to come here. So uh, I will give brief information about the mycoplasma infection because we have uh, undergraduate students. They are listening to us. And here, uh, as we know, mycoplasma space making several, uh, several clinical science in cattle, exactly not in cattle, also humans and some of animals making infection as we know that. Uh, that bacteria can isolate from pneumonia, mastitis and art arthritis. Also they are etiologically related with the otitis, kerat keratoconjunctivitis, synovitis and reproductive disorders. Especially mycoplasma bovis is considered one of the most pathogenic bacteria. It making clinical Uh, and economical losses around the world. And as we know, the bacteria doesn't have cell wall. That is why we cannot use, for example, penicillin antibiotics in the treatment. So it means we have to use uh, more than sometimes uh, two antibiotics to treat this kind of infections. Uh, this is uh, giving an idea. We try to use different Point. We try to focus on different points. That means like we should focus on prevention or control measurement of the infection uh, instead of the treatment procedure. In Turkey, uh, the bacteria Mycoplasma bovis is not notifiable disease. That means if any diagnostic lab detect this bacteria, they don't need to report to government, uh, government office. So that means uh, I mean, if we detect some of bacteria that like not feeble disease, uh, people give more attention. Sometimes they don't want to, even the, they don't want to notify this type of station. So that is why this bacteria is not, not notifiable. So that means people not giving pay attention uh, a lot. <clears throat> the second of second of the point, uh, the government doesn't have a vaccination program against the mycoplasma bovis. And also there is no currently available commercial vaccine for calves in Turkey. So that was the, our main purpose. We made a project. This is ongoing on right now with the Umits Lab and another team members. And that is why we are trying to make a vaccine for the uh, mycoplasma bovis in calves. Here you can see last uh, confirmed case number in last five years. Uh, I got it from Umis Lab, and as you can see, there is no much more uh, number uh, in five years. But uh, the point is that uh, people not giving more attention. That is why the number is low. So as you can see, also in 2020 and 2021, there are just only four cases. So I think this is the because of like we got the you know the. COVID and there was a, some measurement. That is why maybe number is lower than other uh, other years. So uh, why we came together and what was the, our um, aim of the project? Uh, th I think there's a, two answers of these questions. The first one is we, there, like I said, there is no vaccine currently available in Turkey. Actually, there is a one-off but this is only using in cattle mastitis cases. So there is no uh, vaccine in calves. So our main target was that we try to uh, produce a vaccine. So that is why we collect uh, like a hundred strains, mycoplasma bovis strains. We try to first, effect, first detect their uh, antimicrobial resistant genes, virulence genes, protein structure, and we 
try to detect their MLST type, some, something like that. So at the end of that uh, procedure, we try to select the strain as a vaccine candidate. After that, our other team member was working on the new novel uh, adjuvants. So they were trying to use different poly poly polymers like uh, chitosine or um, PLGA, they call like that. I, to be honest, I am not very familiar with it. And also they are gonna use uh, boron nitrite. So they will make, it, they will use nanotechnology and they will try to make the novel adjuvant and we will try on the in vivo studies we're bringing with our vaccine strain. So second of the answer, the aim of the, uh, what was the aim of this webinar? We try to make more awareness for the mycoplasma bovis infection in calves. Like I said before, people not giving more attention. For example, in my, in my lab, we are giving the diagnostic service for the an, uh, animal hospital. For example, we detect mycoplasma bovis. Just clinician taking care of the import, uh, import, taking care of the measurement for this station. I mean, they are if they are treating the animals with the uh, penicillin groups antibiotics, they are changing antibiotics. And that's it. There is no another point for the mycoplasma bodies. That is why we are trying to make more evidence of the uh, for the mycoplasma bodies infection. Here you can see our project teams. Uh, we are coming so many people from different di disciplines, um, including like veterinarian, pharmacists, biologists, pathologists, also uh, some of undergraduate students and graduate students taking part of in that project. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have to give some results about my project right now because we are still ongoing and we haven't started to animal studies in vivo studies that is why i am not able to give some results about the, about that i hope you guys can understand me uh, this situation uh yeah that is all i have today for you all i hope uh, it can give some information about mycoplasma bovis in turkey right now and thank you so much for your attention okay we would like to thank Dr. Cemal Adugüzel for his speech. Now I would like to give the speech first in my speaker, Dr. Guido Loria. But before giving the speech, I will share brief information about him. Dr. Dr. Guido R. Loria works for Italian Veterinary Public Institution. His activity, I'm sorry, his activities as director of special diagnostic area is mainly related to animal diseases diagnosis. With special reference to veterinary pathology, he also coordinates a WOEH reference for laboratory for contagious agalaxia and cooperates as scientific advisor of WOEH and FEO Mediterranean Veterinary Network. His speech title is Clinical and pathological findings in cattle infected with mycoplasma infection, with special reference to mycoplasma bovis outbreaks in Italy. <coughs> Dr. Guido, please, this is your turn. Thank you, Fatma Noor. Thank you for nice introduction. Uh, thank you, Mehmet. Thank you, the colleague of University of Veterinary Medicine. Thank you to the nice friends of uh, Pendic Institute. Uh, I hope to continue our collaboration. Thank you, Robin, for the pleasure to share with the Turkish colleague this nice day of update. So, let me see how to go on. Excuse me, I try to move uh, my presentation. Uh, I think you have to give me the the, could, could you see the, 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 the screen? Mehmet? Yes, can, see. can you yeah. try to yeah, move yeah. it, please? Just a minute, doesn't. Okay. 
Okay, now it's working. Thank yes, you. Excuse me for you no know problem. this little no stop. Problem. So <laughs> this is a uh, the picture, you know, a bit, a bit rough. You know, we were working in the field with Professor Nicola, so not uh, high level biosafety. I think. <laughs> anyway, I were younger, so you will justify. But it's, uh, it was a very nice, uh, nice experiment sponsored by Pfizer to you know, to, to prove that antibiotic, uh, particularly fluoroquinolone, could uh, in some way stop uh, the spreading of uh, uh, one of the most at-risk mycoplasma for Africa, which is uh, contagious bovine pleuropneumonia. So I think uh, this is also, uh, you know, just to, to think about how many implications this kind of diseases they have today, you know, the, the, the fighting against uh, antimicrobial resistance the you know, the, 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 the evolution, the, the arising of uh, strain uh, even more resistant uh, than, than before. Okay. I just uh, introduced myself, uh, just telling you, this is my, my institute in Sicily. It's like Pendic Institute. So we are, uh, we are in charge uh, of, uh, you know, risk assessment. So we are uh, national public laboratories looking for animal disease, food safety, training of, uh, you know, new veterinarians together with the university. And it is located in the, the, the island in the middle of Mediterranean area, up so-called uh, uh, Sicily. So I, I would like to start today. My presentation is uh, uh, divided in two uh, pieces. One are slide, and the other one uh, it's a seven minutes uh, film with some uh, field scenes to share together to discuss uh, field cases. Of course, the quality of the film is not not top level, but it's enough to understand what were going on. Uh, in these farms. This is a picture of a meeting. We were there also with UNIT, the IOM 2013, so 10 years ago. And I, I took this picture because they were asking about mycoplasma bovis disease, some question, you know, which uh, <coughs> I think we can discuss together with Professor Nichols about this disease. As Mehmet said, it's not yet a listed disease. Uh, so for, for some experts, it's very big uh, veterinary risk for some other less. So we still have a lot to say <clears throat> about mycoplasma bovis. And we will try to, to answer these questions, especially, you know, the last two, it's it, it, this, pathogen needs co-infection to, 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 to express the pathology, needs uh, stress factors. So this is very important, of course. So uh, cattle, bovine mycoplasma are many, you know, very many different strains. Some are, you know, like uh, bovoculi are related to keratoconjunctivitis, bovine genitalium, maybe reproductive disorder, uh, many others too, <clears throat> you know, respiratory syndrome, like also this part canadensis. But the most important those, the ones I would like to discuss with you to, uh, today are, my, are the so-called respiratory mycoplasma, Mycoide small coronary and uh, mycoplasma bovis. With regard to the first one, you know very well that this is uh, a listed WOHA disease. Now we don't have any more a list A and list B. We have just a general list, and they, of course, include in the list because of their impact, any kind of impact, impact uh, from the, you know, veterinary health point of view or human health, social impact, you know, uh, impact on the trades, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, for contagious bovine pleuropneumonia, this is a, a, a really recognized pathogen. 
even we may say that in Europe, the disease uh, has a very different pattern than, than Africa. In Africa, it, it is characterized by high mortality rate, whereas in Europe, normally, <laughs> at least the last uh, outbreaks in cattle, in buffaloes, it's considered maybe sporadic, sporadic disease. So uh, still uh, we have a lot to say about, you know, the, 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 the pathogenesis of the disease uh, by mycoplasma, you know, strains. With regard to mycoplasma bovis, it is normally included in the, the big group of uh, bovine respiratory, BRD, bovine respiratory disease. <coughs> of course, if we speak about bovine respiratory disease, the big uh, chapter, you know, virus, bacteria, mycoplasma, whatever, we have uh, huge losses, millions of dollars or euro that affect uh, the, you know, this kind of sector in uh, everywhere in the world. Uh, but uh, there is still a lot, a lot, a lot to say with regard to uh, this disease. With regard to contagious bovine pleuropneumonia, it's clearly, it's clearly classified. You know, if you go to the official books, official report of the disease, we know that uh, mycoplasma mycoides small colony is responsible of uh, fibrinose pleuropneumonia. Whereas, if you want to look for, you know, the, 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 correct, uh, the correct classification of the lesions, uh, the lung lesion caused by mycoplasma bovis, you will find many different, many different kind of, uh, you know, classification named chronic bronchopneumonia, uh, chronic catarrhal bronchopneumonia, chronic necrotic bronchopneumonia, casionecrotic. Or maybe also interstitial pneumonia. You know, still now there is no final final classification. With regard to the clinical sign, apart of you know mortality, as I said before, very high for contagious bovine pleuropneumonia, and uh, you know, surely milder for mycoplasma bovis. All the symptoms are not specific. So it's very difficult to, to make diagnosis just from you know, the clinical behavior of uh, the calf of the cow. So <clears throat> of course, you, we need the laboratory confirmation to, you know, to reach a diagnosis. So we today start together with uh, discussing the, the most known of uh, respiratory mycoplasma, which is uh, uh, mycoplasma mycodes morconis, you know, seeing, you know, sh sh I will try to, to, to show you how is the disease and uh, about uh, the lesions. <coughs> and then we compare with the mycoplasma bovis. So the, the unusual, you know, the very peculiar uh, anatomopathological uh, findings, you know, but the very peculiar behavior of uh, this strain is that normally in the 80% of cases, it affects uh, one, one lobe, one lung, not both. It is unilateral disease. You know, in this case, in this picture, you can see a big sequestra here. Probably this animal was just slaughtered, but was uh, uh, recovered, of course, without uh, clinical sign. Of course, uh, there are also, also other lesions. Uh, you know, if we read the report uh, either in Africa and in Europe about uh, contagious bovine pneumonia, the majority of cases, of course, have respiratory. Uh, pathologies, but also other other tissues, other uh, uh, apparatus are, are, are uh, you know involved. 
So just to tell you how it works in, in, uh, in controllable inflow power. So the antigen enter via, via you know, respiratory growth, arriving in the deep, uh, in the deep tissue to the bronchioli, and then it creates a catarrhal bronchiolitis. Then the pathogen from, from bronchioli migrate to lymphatic ducts. The road is, of course, following the, the lymph the, to reach the mediastinic lymph node and blood vessel. What happens when the, the, the antigen from bronchioli go to the interstitium, go to lymphatic duct? We, we have an enlargement of lung septa, mainly caused by edema and, of course, the presence of the antigen and also could, uh, could get even worse when we have thrombosis of lymphatic duct, which can create necrosis of interstitium. In this next picture, you see in the red, red color, the antigen, you know, moving through lymphatic duct, these are lymph nodes, reaching, you know, the, the, the blood vessel uh, by the time. So, <clears throat> If, uh, if uh, we have thrombosis of lymphatic duct, we get uh, an interstitial necrosis uh, uh, and by accumulation of fibrin, we can have fibrosis of, the, of this area of the tissue. But uh, it's very complicated uh, uh, lesion, uh, the, the one of, uh, of contagious bovine pleuropneumonia. So you also slowly, the progression of the of the disease the spreading of the antigen to the rest of lung parenchyma either continuing by lymphatic duct but also you know by blast blood vessels you know have you seen before that the antigen arrived in the in the in the lymph node and have uh, you know the possibility to reach the blood vessel when they create when create thrombosis and parenchymal necrosis. And then uh, if the, the evolution is, uh, you know, uh, I, I might say, uh, uh, not, not a, a, a good evolution, we have sequestra. So uh, all this uh, pattern of lesion create the so-called marble, marbled lung. Uh, so it means that in the same time, we have different degree of lesions caused by the, the, the spreading, the infection of the mycoplasma mycoides to the lung tissue and to the interstitium. Uh, in, moreover, you have also, uh, you know, more color added to this marble lung, some caused by erythrocyte accumulation, uh, plus cell desquamation, some due to the arrival uh, in the subacute and chronic phase of neutrophils, which, Sorry. Uh, which uh, infiltrate the tissue to remove fibrin. So uh, the, the organism, the lung can react either by, you know, by the help of uh, white cells removing the, 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 the pathogen, removing the, 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 the diseased cells uh, with lysis and functional recovery, or, you know, uh, severe necrosis and sequestra. What, why this, uh, this lesion may be uh, difficult to say so far, uh, I, and uh, I tried to update myself looking also if there were new data about uh, you know the 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 the, the uh, you know the pathological factor of mycoid small colony surely it's a good producer of at least the africa strains of uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide which uh, you know which uh, severely affect uh, the respiratory cells, but it's, it's not only, you know, this uh, aggression by the 
the, the mycoides enzymes, but also probably related to the presence in his membrane of a galactan, which is a, a you know, a molecule uh, which are very similar to the poly poly polysaccharides uh, uh, which belong uh, the lung surfactant. So in the end, uh, it is proven that there is also uh, as additional lesion, this uh, hypersensitivity of third type due to the formation, the creation of uh, immunocomplexes. And now some picture just to show you how it works. So we, we, I told you at the beginning, we have the invasion of the interstitium with edema, eh? edema, presence of fibrin and sometimes uh, thrombotic lesion, this is a typical, typical example. You, you see a very enlarged, you know, interlobular set. And in this slide, you see the accumulation in this moment of, uh, you know, uh, pleural fluid, inflammatory pleural fluid. This is a subacute phase, the so-called marbled lung, you know, where you see different pattern, surely, <coughs> <clears throat> we recognize three, three kind of uh, CBPP lesions, like you know, red, uh, you know, red hepatization, gray hepatization, and very strong marked, you know, uh, enlargement of interlobular septa. Not yet uh, severe fibrosis here. This is a, a more chronic. You know, we are evolving to the you know, that the animal, the lung, try to, you know, to, to limit the, the, the infected area of lung uh, with the, the disease. And as you see much more fibrosis of the, of the lung as this very yellow, more, you know, uh, larger the septa to, to, you know, to close, to, re, to, to, to give a, a limit to the, the infection. And then uh, uh, the, the, the other uh, anatomopathological finding that you, which sometimes you may find, may find also in mycoplasma bovis, or you may find also in the small ruminant mycoplasma, in mycoides large colony, so-called the capri, you know, mycoides capri. They, they, they have also this uh, sequestra, not of course so large like, this example in, uh, in uh, contagious bovine pleuropneumonia, which uh, you see this necrotic tissue, which normally is aseptic, not bacteria normally, or very few mycoides, but no, no you know, you, uh, other kind of bacteria contaminants. And the organism is really surrounded by a, a, a thin layer of uh, fibrinos. Uh, tissue which will uh, close the problem uh, for a while, for a while. And these are, uh, you know, this is, uh, this picture could be linked with the first one I showed you, telling, uh, telling that, uh, you know, the Pfizer would prove that uh, subadministrating antibiotic, an effective antibiotic, maybe you could reduce the spreading of the disease. This is still an answer we can't really say yes or no, because too many, you know, of course, like in many diseases, too many different factors, but uh, surely in the high percentage, we slaughtered not less than 100 animals, majority show with this small sequestra. So it means these animals were clinically healthy, but uh, recovered after, or, uh, you know, a severe attack or, you know, even milder attack of the disease. Probably this animal, at least the Italian pathologist uh, uh, were saying that this animal have a very <coughs> strong coughing attack could break and cause a restart a recrudescence of the disease. Uh, actually, I don't know, but uh, could be possible, of course. 
And then uh, also the, the, the fibrotic, you know, uh, response from the lung, from the organism can, can open, reduce the, the uh, you know, the, the problem, can limit the problem. Of course, this is an area of lung which will never be, you know, functional. Now some, uh, <coughs> some other slide to see. This is not a microscope slide. This is a stereo microscope, just to see the enlargement of uh, interstitium. And this is the, the most uh, I, I, I asked, uh, I, I just took from, uh, I has taken from this uh, very recent publication about, you know, histology or contagion of ampullary pneumonia when summarized the most important lesion, you know, enlargement and thrombus, uh, thrombi inside the lymphatic vessels. Then uh, the pleura enlarged because it is covered by a thick fibrin layer. Or both bronchioles and deeply the alveoli, they contain a massive presence of infiltration of uh, white cells, particularly neutrophils. And then also the lymphoid tissue. In this case, it's a sequestrum surrounded by fibrin. In this other case, we see a vasculitis. So you see how many kinds of lesion which attack the parenchyma, the vessels, the lymphatic duct. duct. That's why, you know, uh, contrabiopropomonia has this such a unique uh, pattern. This is uh, immune histochemistry. I don't want to be longer. Of course, the presence of the antigen either, you know, in, 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 in the respiratory areas, in the blood vessel, in the lymph node, et cetera, et cetera, it spreads, uh, you know, in all the uh, component of uh, respiratory tissues. And this is, uh, you know, how immune histochemistry helps to understand the ziopathogenesis of a disease. So this is the picture I showed you before, seeing the antigen going down inside the lymph node, utilizing the, the lymphatic duct, and particularly in this case, we are in the subcapsular sinus. So the antigen is going down, down to the blood vessel to reach the blood, uh, you know, network, the, the, the blood circulation. In this case, uh, it, it can arrive, can reach also other, other organs, not only the lung. In fact, uh, it's possible that many pathologists have reported also lesions to other apparatus, particularly uh, to kidneys, you know, you can see this renal infarction, you know, this is caused by, uh, caused by uh, mycoplasma, mycodes, small colony. Okay, so this is the introduction. I hope uh, I, 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 I were clear to show you how evolved the pathology of contagious bovine pleuropneumonia, which is still a disease which uh, worry the, the the, you know, the, the, the scientific community uh, sometimes disappear for a while, sometimes reoccur. There is a re-emergence, especially in African countries where we observe, of course, uh, the highest rate of mortality. And still today, it is considered as, uh, you know, cause of famine, of hunger in Africa. What about mycoplasma bovis? I also wrote here respiratory disease, but it's difficult to give a proper classification. Surely uh, it is uh, one of the pathogens included together with the IBR, uh, uh, syncytial virus, uh, uh, manehemia, pasteurella, hemophilus, blah, blah, and, and many other also mycoplasma. Uh, among uh, bovine respiratory pathogens. But uh, it's still a disease we probably in your uh, 33 outbreak, you have found different characteristics according to the, you know, the local situation to the farm management. Uh, so far, uh, many 
So mycoplasma bovis has been isolated uh, from different lesions, very, very different lesions, uh, including otitis, meningitis, keratoconjunctivitis. <coughs> but in reality, what it's more common observed, it's uh, respiratory syndrome and polyarthritis in calves and uh, mastitis and genital disease in cow. Even I have to say, uh, even as we will see in my personal experience, even respiratory syndrome, uh, uh, probably not only linked to the presence of mycoplasma bovis, uh, is, uh, you know, is characteristic of the infection also in adult cattle. Uh, of course, when we, uh, when, when, when we started to work in Italy to look for the pathogen, uh, with the, after my experience in the laboratory of Robin Nicholas, which I have to thank to introduce me to mycoplasma infection, mycoplasma pathology, we started to look for the disease in Italy. Uh, also because there were rumors that in some uh, particular kind of uh, production of livestock production, calves production, in Italy, in the north, we are used to produce a, a calf called the white meat calf. So these animals are kept like poultry, are kept uh, indoor in a very close environment. And uh, normally uh, with uh, you know, pretty high uh, presence of, uh, of animals, so there is not too much space. They are concentrated in small, in small barn, in small pen. So in this uh, <coughs> kind of, uh, kind of, uh, of production of breeding animal, it's, uh, there were already the evidence of uh, mycoplasma isolation, mycoplasma isolation. But when I started to look for the disease in Italy, <coughs> of course I found that this is very different from uh, contagious bovine pleuropneumonia was much more related to you know, the respiratory lobe with cranioventral progression, whereas, you know, mycoides more commonly goes to diaphragmatic lobe, it's monolateral. No such a huge enlargement of interlobular septa like CBPP, not always involvement of pleura, and uh, necrotic foci and lobular diffusion. Well, Okay, so probably because each strain, each species of mycoplasma has its own, you know, factors to, to create uh, disease. And this is also a summary table of histology for mycoplasma bovis. For those cases, I started to look inside, you know, there was this presence of, uh, accumulation of fibrin in some areas, uh, okay, the, the pleural surface. You know, the, the, the bronchioli and the bronchis was uh, full and filled with the inflammatory cell, neutrophil. So it was uh, classified as catarrhal purulent bronchitis. I remember also this the triangular, very uh, unusual uh, shape of necrotic area surrounded by inflammatory cell and of course fibrin which is coming to to you know to uh, close the, the the infection and what is characteristic of mycoplasma bovis the the presence of the very marked and visible lymphatic areas lymph lymphoid areas lymphatic tissue which is called the bulk appunto hyperplasia of this lymphoid tissue which is bronchio associated associated lymphatic tissue uh, 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 still remember when with uh, robin and uh, professor uh, scanziani a good pathologist from Italy, finally, thanks to the fact that we could uh, uh, have a good antibody reacting 
uh, in immunohistochemistry against mycoplasma bodies, we could prove that when there were lesions, in this case is necrosis, there is the pathogen in absence of uh, virus, in absence of manhenia, pastorella, etc. So it is uh, in some way one more proof that uh, mycoplasma bovis is a bad boy, is an aggressive uh, uh, pathogen. And now some more data. By the time that was the period, <coughs> I really enjoyed because we, I started from Sicily, but also the other regions started to investigate. And they found that mycoplasma bovis is the most frequent bacterial respiratory pathogen in the, you know, in their kind of uh, sector, in uh, BL cows, in the meat producing cows. I, I found uh, high percentage, around 27%, also the colleague 11, you know, 67%. So very high, you know, uh, high prevalence of the infection in, in Italy. And then uh, the colleague, uh, we, we, we organized the project, uh, you know, looking for, uh, again, what were going inside the livestock, uh, far, the, the, inside the farms, Italian farms. And 140 meat cattle were, were selected just to see what were going on. Some with uh, clinical uh, disease, some, uh, or, or at least not clinical disease, but with lesion, lesions found at the abattoir. 70 were adult, 70 were cows. At the beginning from this animal, uh, the, the, there was a blood, blood sampling and we found that 100% of calves, 70 out of 70 were positive, whereas cattle, adult cattle much less. By Eliza, this is a, a, a commercial kit very easy to, to find. But what was interesting, you know, Mehmet, you are a microbiology guy, uh, that we uh, uh, couldn't find, couldn't find, couldn't find, you know, the, the my, mycoplasma bovis in the lung of uh, lung and lymph nodes of adult cattle, but we found in uh, excuse me for Italian in calves, in calves uh, there were seventeen percent of positive. Among that, 5.7% uh, with co-infection with other <coughs> bacteria. So the, the, the previous slide could say that also the adult cattle, of course, got in contact with the mycoplasma bovis, but uh, once probably they were adult mature, also the immune system were mature, not, not more problem of circulation of the pathogen, but still maintaining high level of antibodies. So in, in those animals, in, you know, in those that have uh, pathology of this group, in the calves, of course, we have found two different kinds of uh, pattern, of uh, uh, anatomy, uh, histopathological pattern. The first one, uh, which uh, uh, concerned seven cases was a severe necrotic suppurative bronchopneumonia uh, with the high presence of mycoplasma bodies, like you see in this uh, picture. You know, this is uh, immunohistochemistry. The brown it's mycoplasma bodies on the border of the lesion. This is necrosis. This gray area behind a lot of cell neutrophils, plasma cells, macrophages, et cetera, et cetera, to try to, to, to limit the problem. So this is very severe, uh, you know, uh, lesion. The other one, pattern number two, was a milder lesion, uh, showing interstitial pneumonia and catarla pneumonia without necrotic suppurative aspect, without the most uh, severe aspect of uh, mycoplasma aggression. And also the very few, look the uh, immunohistochemistry, a very few mycoplasma, not a lot like the picture before. 
even there is there is a good uh, you know reaction you know around these are okay so what uh, what was happening how we could interpret these two different behavior of the disease we which could also justify maybe why in some areas mycoplasma bovis kills cattle in other areas is not just an evidence of the abattoir. Probably <coughs> one, one of the answers, we don't know if all the answers, because uh, of this factor, which is of course uh, uh, individual factor of the animal, the expression of uh, second class measure is to compatibly complex. This factor is the one which helps, you know, you know, found in the C, in the CD4 T cells lymphocyte, which show, which take the antigen to the phagocyte. And that's a very clear, clear, uh, you know, image you can you can clear picture you can understand so uh, when you buy immunohistochemistry in the in the in the lesion in the mild lesion no no you have a scarce expression of uh, uh, and uh, you know the the measure is to is to compatibly complex class second there is a reduct, uh, you know, activation of the antigen presentation mechanism with massive bacterial infection. So in this case, you see that the brown color is the factor, not the antigen. So you see there is a very low expression here, but there is necrosis and massive infiltration of, uh, you know, uh, white cells, you know, inflammatory cells. In the opposite, where you have a very high expression of uh, <coughs> the, uh, the, the, the histocompatibility factor, the measure histocompatibility factor class second, like in this case, a lot of brown color here, a lot of brown color, but much less lesions. So it means the, the activation of immune system, the activation of antigen presentation mechanism works very well and reduce the, the severity of the lesion. And also, this is the, uh, just I would like to add something else also because in, in, in my uh, small movie, you see some scenes about mastitis we found some cases of purulent, you know, mastitis. For some aspect also resembling contours of galaxy and sheep and goat, you know, this is a, you know, atrophy, you know, sclerosis of the other, which very, uh, very severe lesion in adult cows. Uh, the same, you know, the histology showed this marked inflammation, marked, uh, you know, uh, white cells uh, infiltration among, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the glandular lumen of the other, which get worse and worse, that can arrive to, uh, of course, the arrival of fibrin, you know, and, and sclerosis of the organ. And now I just introduce you what we will see in, uh, in the short film I will show you, uh, there are three different farms. This is a, a, a very good farm, you know, very high standard uh, welfare and high standard also biosecurity. Maybe there were some problem, but we will discuss in the end. In the Ragusa area, which is uh, such a very, you know, uh, high productive farm like the one of Parmesan, uh, Parmesan in Northern Italy. When we have observed <laughs> a very bad uh, flu, very bad uh, respiratory infection in these brown cows, you know, and that was the reason why the farmer, you know, called us, 
to manage something because even he has a, a farm vet, he has the expert inside the farm following the animal. Even the biosecurity, the biosafety, disinfection, whatever, in this farm is really well applied, but there were some problems. Uh, some more pictures, look at this infection of teats, animal are uh, spraying milk because they are high producer animal. Then the second uh, scenes are related to uh, meat producing, veal calves. This is a park, Madonia. You see a nice, beautiful woods around. It's very big farm, big farm. Also in this case, in the previous farm, that there were 10% mortality. In this case, 6 8% in one special pen, in one special room when they use it to introduce the cows. And this is a very big farm, also very built in rational, in really modern way. In this beautiful village in Sicily, Gerachi Siculo in this uh, park, park. So they, they of course advert high quality, high quality meat. But as you see, all the the calves were kept in this condition. So before we have seen a nice picture of a very, you know, modern, uh, man, um, managed, you know, buildings of a, a, a real calf farm, and, and now you see this is the same farm. And this is what, when, when they called me, what was happening, you know, calf dying, uh, arthritis, limping of these calves. And the third one was uh, very unusual for me because uh, this is a typical familiar farm. So the, the, the family, the guy, the lady, the children, the, the boys, the, the sons will help to, and this is an extensive farm, no intensive production farm like the first one. Normally I am ever observed mycoplasma bovis in this kind of farming. So what I mean, when they are in the extensive, uh, you know, management. Uh, so they graze outside. They are, they go to the to the to the. They go indoor only for milking. Then they stay outside. It's very rare to see mycoplasma bovis. Anyway, I have to say, we we observe this uh, problem, and uh, this is you know the lymph node. You know the swollen lymph node. This is one of the cow. And look how ugly were the milk uh, coming from different animals. Okay, so we go to see this. Uh, I, I hope to, to, to manage properly. Maybe Mehmet helped me to show this seven, seven minute movie, and then we make conclusion very rapidly, very rapidly. Oh, let me get out. Okay, let me how can get out. Okay. I have to understand how to get out. Okay. And just a minute, I start the movie. I start the movie. Uh, could you see the, the film? Uh, not yet. You need to, I guess, share one more time. Okay. Like, okay. You know, share your presentation, right? It will I be don't safe. know why it doesn't allow me to do it. Uh, I already gave permission. That's it. Okay, good. Yeah. Technology is not my best. Uh, I don't know why it doesn't. Uh...
I try to, I close the other, I close the other presentation maybe, okay. and I start the, and then we, I reopen again. Okay. Let's, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, Mehmet, could you give me the allo ones to enter? No, I already gave. Yeah, uh, I haven't changed uh, anything okay. else. I mean, uh, I think you should open the video. Oh, then you should. Yeah. I I call it that. Okay. A very good digital colleague, maybe he helps me because I like to show you that this. Uh, right. It's only in Zoom. Mm -hmm. I am in Zoom, but uh, they don't see the movie. Don't see that no, 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 don't see that. Okay. Normal schermo. It's, 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 yeah. it's fine now. It's fine. Yes, that's fine. Okay, right good. Now. Perfect. Yeah. That's it. Okay, just uh, we can make a few comments together. We are inside the first farm, the dairy farm, cow dairy farm. You see this animal, it's a breathing with the abdomen, no, with the thorax. <coughs> it's abdominal, more frequent respiratory act. And what you see also, it's this uh, nasal discharge. <coughs> the farmers were telling me that after importing 10 Holstein, 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 in this farm of Brown, which were very healthy, importing this 10 cow Holstein, this kind of problem started to, uh, to be shown. And uh, uh, when we arrived, 10 cows already died. So it's not very easy that one cow died because of, he, he has lost 10 cows at that time, but the problem is still continuing. It's still continuing because, because uh, uh, once uh, in this kind of, of, uh, of you know, kind of production, the disease enter, it's very hard to get out, to, you know, to sort out the problem. Then this is the second farm that, that you see it is, uh, calves are limping, all limping, you know, so many, you know, with the problem to the legs, and it was the, 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 but the problem here, if you see, it's this pen, this uh, big room, this barn where they use it to collect all the calves together. So it was the, the, the big mistake because when you have to, to produce animal for meat, actually, there are not so many problems because by the time in few weeks, few months, they go to the abattoir. But in this case, once he mixed it all together in this uh, barn, probably infected barn, uh, the disease uh, uh, affect the production, creating, you know, killing calves and also, you know, creating a productive problem because uh, they need antibiotic, uh, anyway. This is the third farm. Again, it is an extensive farm, familiar farm producing, you know, milk. And the farmer called us because there was this new problem, not possible to, to, to resolve with, to sort out by antibiotic treatment and to understand how to manage. So we went there, of course, to sample to sample animals. And you see the biosafety, you know, the management of the farm is very, you know, poor, it's very scarce. But you see happy animal, they are, you know, spraying milk 
when they see the farmer, you know. And this is one of the animal we, who sh which uh, show with the, the disease. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, there was a, a loss of weight, of course, and also uh, the, the very big uh, swelling, very uh, important swelling of the supramammary lymph nodes. Maybe we can see here very clear, you know. So just to summarize, we had the first very, you know, high biosafety and good welfare farm, dairy farm with the respiratory syndrome in cows, with mortality in cows. The second farm with arthritis and the mortality in cows. And this third farm with the mastitis, severe mastitis. <coughs> Probably this owner will keep the animal, even they produce less, but it's not the business of the first farm because they need the high productive animals. They can't uh, no, spend time to treat with antibiotics, to look after all the animal. And these are more cows with arthritis in the same, in the same farm as I told you here. Of course, all of them tried with uh, antibiotic, uh, of course, uh, starting from uh, oxytetracycline, higher dosage, uh, and, uh, you know, then uh, fluoroquinolone, bitril, uh, you know, many, many, uh, many efforts, many, many, uh, <coughs> many, many, ways to stop the, the disease, but uh, was not possible. And uh, just to anticipate you that the, a, a, good, uh, a good tool in the end was the production of uh, uh, autologous vaccine. So we isolated the strain and we gave uh, farm vaccine, so inactivated vaccine, uh, to those uh, those farmers, and it helped. It helped a lot from the clinical point of view, but it's very difficult to say so far if they are now, if uh, mycoplasma bovis is still uh, circulating, is still creating problem, or they completely get get off, get out of uh, of the problem. And you see some of these animals were producing drop, drop of, uh, of, uh, of milk or purulent exudate. Look here, it was a very disaster for the farmer. Okay. I, I just complete with the last two slides. Could you see Mehmet? Not, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Yes, that's fine. Good. So just uh, just to close, so we have these three farms with the in all in, in each one we observe that we register mortality and the mycoplasma bovis, uh, you know, where in different kind of farms in different kind of production doesn't matter. So he found he has found his way to affect. The, the the farmer to affect the animals, you know. Uh, probably the the, 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 the first uh, critical factor in the first farm 
which were very high standards of management and welfare and biosafety, was introduction of animal without uh, checking in the lab for mycoplasma bodies, or at least to utilize, to wait with a quarantine period. Even the quarantine measure in the case of mycoplasma bodies probably didn't say too much because those animals were, were, you know, clinically healthy. Probably they just carried the pathogen inside the farm. When the disease found, you know, a free, a free herb and could, uh, you know, could spread everywhere. The second farm also high, high, good, good, uh, you know, good farm, high standard of biosecurity, welfare, different rooms, etc. But the problem was that we don't know why, we don't know why they they use it to introduce all calves. Paola, puoi chiudermi per favore, mi faccio they use it to introduce all calves in one pen. So they use it to mix all calves together at the beginning, because they then were put in other uh, pens to, uh, you know, to grow, to improve the weight. So it was the big risk because they use it not to apply what we say, wall full, wall empty, so to clear, the pen and to make this infection, to make sanitation and to restart. It was a very weak point, which created uh, this arising of uh, mycoplasma bovis cases. The third farm is still for me, very a big uh, uh, interrogative point because in, in this typical uh, familiar farms, you know, when animal grades outside, we haven't seen, you know, we haven't seen uh, this kind of pathogen, or if present doesn't create so much problem, but probably uh, not only because of introduction of a couple of new animals, but probably because of the, the strain. Probably it was a strain which arrived, it was a very aggressive strain, which uh, uh, started to, uh, you know, to infect by by the probably the milking machine all all the animal. So we are finishing. You know what to say. What to say about mycoplasma bovis? We say that we we may say it's not as only a problem of calves. Of course, it's also a problem of uh, adult animal of production and uh, bilateral pneumonia. If uh, we speak about respiratory disease, moderate lesion, I don't know, probably also Professor Nicholas will tell us about what's going on in New Zealand. So not real moderate lesion, but also severe lesion. More consolidation than marbling in the inspection of the lung in the abattoir, rare pleuritis, small rare sequestra like lesion, and uh, difficult to, to say if it still uh, could be considered a management disease. But it's a matter of fact that at, uh, at least at OIE level, OIE level, now we say OIE, WOHA, WOHA level, they not yet uh, list mycoplasma bovis among, uh, you know, like the other infectious diseases, uh, but probably it's the time to show them and to prove that uh, it is uh, a problem which has an impact even much more than ma many other pathogens. So I, I, I finish, I really thanks uh, Mehmet, the uh, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine. Thank you for this uh, very nice appointment, nice meeting, and uh, really I hope we can uh, continue to cooperate, uh, not only online, hopefully. <laughs> I really, I am really happy to see again uh, Yumit Semvili. Uh, really, I, I regard her for what uh, uh, she has done in the field of mycoplasma disease of animal, uh, either uh, small ruminant, uh, poultry. Congratulations for such a good work done. Also, vaccine production, it's uh, very 
very well known uh, among us which uh, work in mycoplasma. All my colleagues, my institute, uh, Professor Nicholas Robin, a good friend and good scientist and the group of University of Milan. Thank you to everybody. Thanks a lot. Okay. We would like to thank Dr. Guido for his valuable speech. Is there any question to Dr. Guido? If there's any question, please put in the chat box. I will ask him. Uh, I would ask you a question. So you showed us a video, right? Um, and also your presentation was very informative to us. Uh, I really thank you for it. So it, you mentioned in the video, even if we are using high dosage of antibiotics, so we are not able to treat the animals, right? Uh, after the you prepared autogenous vaccine, then you solve the problem. So I am asking to this question because we have um, DVM candidates. They are listening to us. It will give some information for them because uh, they some of them will be like clinician and they will try to treat animals like this type of infection and they will not give give they will not get success. So that is why I'm asking that question. So in that situation, why vaccine is more important than um, antibiotic treatments? So thank you, Mehmet. I, I have the opportunity with your good question to questions to, to say two different, you know, different concepts. The first one, uh, in, the, in the first farm, <coughs> the one day you consider these people not only milk animals which produce uh, 25 liters something like that of milk every day but they give uh, oxytocin to improve to each animal every you know day to during milking uh, procedure so very i may say very stressful from the productive point of view for animal so in this case, even we gave, we advised the vaccination to this, uh, to this farmer, but uh, so far in this situation was not, uh, not, not uh, you know, probably the, the, the too much uh, stressful, you know, factors, including the presence of mycoplasma bovis, my, my, also, we in, the, in that case made many, many other investigation about uh, virus, and there were some uh, virus, including some new dose, particularly D D influenza D virus D uh, flu virus or bovine. But the the cows died were because of mycoplasma bovis in the land. So probably he gave the last. Uh, shot to the, the, the cow. In the other two cases, in the calves uh, farm and the you know, extensive uh, management farm, the vaccine was really profitable, was very good. So probably because uh, animals are not such, uh, uh, you know, high productive uh, standards. So probably in that case was, was a good possibility to avoid, to treat and treat with such expensive antibiotic. You have also to, to think that the vaccine we uh, subministered was of course, you know, done by the local strain, which is a very good point, you know, the wild strain of the farm, but we used to produce uh, autogenous vaccine by formalin, by formalin inactivation procedure. And then we add aluminum hydroxide of saponin. I believe that when you utilize uh, formalin, you destroy the majority of the antigenic, you know, potential protein. So I don't know. In any case, we have today from the practical point of view was effective, like, like what happened in general with contagious agalaxia in sheep and goats with a similar strain. Uh, and for us, vaccine is the most important tool uh, to help uh, farmers. 
but uh, a very you know high produ productive standards uh, it's difficult to to give an answer or to act like uh, in Canada or New Zealand uh, some farmers prefer they cow they eliminate the positive evidence thanks so much Okay, uh, I think uh, Dr. Nicholas have uh, a question for Dr. Guido. We we cannot hear you, Dr. Nicholas. Can you hear Sorry. me now? Can you hear yes, me? Yes, we can. Yes, we yes. can hear you now. Okay, I've taken my uh, headphones out. Um, yeah, it's really a point about the notifiable uh, disease aspect. Um, when I raised this uh, many years ago to the OIE, uh, they said um, that Mycoplasma bovis was too widespread, too widespread to be considered a notifiable disease because now it's present in just about every country in the world. Um, it really wouldn't be practical to, at all to make it notifiable. Um, so I think it's, it's very unlikely to be made notifiable, sadly, uh, <laughs> in the OIE. Do, do you agree, Guido? Or? Yeah, so uh, I, I have followed the approach of European, you know, of European uh, community, because, you know, I work a bit on regulations. So, for instance, we have another strange disease, you know, of, of, of bees. But just to make you an example, uh, and, and the European community classified the varroa, varroasis, which is a tick of bees, you know? Because they say, the, the experts were saying, listen, against this parasite, it's not possible to do anything. You can't stop in the border bees. Bees go wherever they like, bees move. So not, not possible to, to make a regulation with uh, regulate, the movement of uh, bee houses around, because in any case, they move by themselves. And this is true. But the European Commission said, no, we need to list, because in this way, we will make research. We will look for new tools to, you know, uh, to stop the infection, new drug, new, you know, uh, management tools to, uh, you know, to, to combat the, the disease. In some way, I agree. So I think mycoplasma bovis now in some nation, it's a disaster. So it's time to do something. If uh, you leave the, 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 the situation on the, you know, look at the local level, uh, probably there is no no way to stop this uh, this pathogen, which has two, I believe, characteristic. Robin, you will say better than me. One is the natural resistance to antibiotic, first one, and second one is natural capability to modify its genetic characteristics. So, at the moment, we have some areas where bovis is uh, very calm, others were creating a disaster. So I think we must make more surveillance and more research on control. Okay. Uh, is there any question for Dr. Guido? Okay, if there's no more question, I would like to pass to our last invited speaker, Dr. Robin Nicholas. Now I will share brief information about him. He has long and varied career at Animal and Plant Health Agency in UK, leading the Mycoplasma Group over 20 years, becoming a OIE reference center for small ruminant mycoplasmas and UK reference laboratory for mycoplasmas. He has traveled widely around Mediterranean, in particular Turkey, Portugal, and Italy, and concluded technical missions to Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East to advise on ruminant mycoplasma diseases. He has written five books, including Mycoplasma Protocol in 1998 and Mycoplasma Disease of Ruminants in 
2008 and over 300 peer-reviewed papers and articles in the field for which he was elected fellow of in the Royal College of Pathologists and awarded or a visiting professorship in life science by Kingston University in 2010. Today, while he is semi-retired, he lectured at universities and provide consultancy on mycoplasmosis to several Italian institutes. And he is the government, oh, sorry, he is a member of international commission, including advising the New Zealand government on the eradication of mycoplasma bovis. Also, he is, he is quite good cook specialist in Asian and Middle Eastern food. His speech title is The Search for Effective Vaccine Against Respiratory Infection Caused by Mycoplasma bovis. Please, Dr. Robin, this is your turn. Okay, let me uh, share the screen. Oh, okay, that's easy. Okay, I uh, hope you can all hear me. Um, again, thank you, Mehmet, for the invitation. Uh, it's a shame that the meeting uh, wasn't in Istanbul instead. We have a lot to blame COVID for. I would love to be back there. Um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about bovis, mycoplasma bovis. It wasn't my, um, you know, my first uh, mycoplasma to, to study. Um, I was heavily involved uh, with the CBPP outbreaks in the early 90s when uh, CBPP unexpectedly uh, came back uh, to Europe after 20 years. And I think, you know, the uh, material that Guido uh, delivered in his lecture, I think is, is still very relevant because uh, CBPP, uh, it's only been um, eradicated from Europe or disappeared from Europe uh, in the last 20 years, really. And uh, so it could well be hiding in very small uh, herds uh, wherever, you know, maybe even in Eastern Turkey. I know certainly, uh, Many years ago, uh, there was a survey carried out, a serological survey uh, for CBPP, and uh, there was no evidence, of course, of, of CBPP. But I think uh, the disease, CBPP, is a disease of uh, broken veterinary services, of wars, of uh, you know, earthquakes, very, very sadly. Um, you know, when veterinary services break down, then uh, CBPP can, can reappear. So I think... Uh, I thank Guido for reminding me of what uh, DBPP looks like and, you know, for many of the participants of this, uh, uh, um, <clears throat> of this seminar. Um, I also worked with Contagious Agalactia following a chance meeting with Guido in, in Sardinia and became very interested in, in the disease. And uh, we became a OIE reference center for, for um, <clears throat> contagious agalactia, despite the fact that we hadn't had it up until very, very recently, uh, probably a few years ago, someone brought in some pet goats, which were infected with uh, agalactia. So the experience I had with Guido was, was, was very, very helpful. <clears throat> um, contagious caprine pleuronomonia is the other major um, disease um, OIE listed disease. And again, I, I thank Umit for the fantastic opportunities we had of looking for the disease in Thrace after unexpected uh, serious outbreaks of, uh, of a pleuronomonia in, in goats in Thrace. And uh, we had a lot of fun, I think, and a lot of, um, certainly a lot of activity relating to CCPP. Um, and I'm very, very grateful for that. Well, after all these exotic diseases, um, I started looking around the UK to wonder, you know, does Britain have um, uh, important mycoplasma problems? And uh, yes, we did, um, although it was not very well uh, thought of. People thought of the, the viruses, the, the bacteria, that were causing respiratory disease, but no one was really looking at mycoplasma bovis. So uh, it was a great opportunity for me to 
get that down um, deep, deep and dirty, as we say, uh, in the farms around Britain, looking for Mycoplasma bovis. And of course, we found it, and uh, just about every other country in the world has it. And I think, you know, people are finally uh, uh, becoming aware of the importance of this disease. Um, certainly, there's a lot more publications uh, produced um, on the subject of, of Mycoplasma bovis. There were conferences held in Canada. Um, it certainly is a, a problem in, in North America and, and many other countries. Um, so really what I want to do in this, in this talk is um, give some idea of the disease. And I apologize for any duplication uh, that will uh, arise. Um, um, yes, you know, it, it's inevitable that I'll be repeating some of the things that Guido said, but perhaps in a, a slightly different way. Um, so I'll be looking at the occurrence of the disease around the world. Uh, um, and then looking at how it's controlled, and then ending up talking about vaccines, not um, you know, the history of Mycoplasma bovis vaccines um, around the world, um, and then really looking at some of my own um, ex uh, experience of carrying out uh, experiment, uh, vaccine experiments in the farms in the UK and in Italy, and we even had a little go at uh, developing and uh, evaluating some vaccines in Turkey, but uh, th this didn't really go too far. Um, so, um, right, what am I going to do? Yep, let's have a let's have a have a look at um, some of the things here. Um, the problem with Mycoplasma bovis, unlike CBPP, for example, is that. Um, the calf pneumonia complex is very multifactorial. There are many organisms involved um, and different balances you'll oh, find. Sorry, different... sorry for I'm I'm doing this, but do you have any slide or some kind of uh, visual things for the speech? Uh, yeah. we, we can we cannot see it. We cannot see it. Ah, right. Sorry for that. Sorry for I'm. Oh, okay. Um, Right, um, let's have a look. Very cool. Right, let me see. Right, share screen. Okay. Yes, then choose the presentation and come. Is that up. okay? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks for reminding me. I was talking to the screen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. So you've not missed anything. Um, let me just show you. Yeah, that was my original um, uh, screen. Okay, um, so so we're here now, and I'm saying, basically, I'm saying um, that the disease is very, very complex. Um, oh, it's good I can see you. So at least I know I'm not talking to uh, to the wall here. So mycoplasma. Uh, the uh, calf pneumonia complex is, is multifactorial. Um, many uh, viruses, bacteria, and of course, uh, mycoplasmas all contribute to this, which is why it's such a major challenge because every farm will contain different levels of these particular organisms. And it's fairly rare that uh, you get pure infections of mycoplasma bovis on a farm. And you know that would be helpful, unlike, as I said, mycoplasmicoides, where primary uh, infections are, are the are the rule, if you like. So let's have a look at some of the um, bacteria, uh, other microorganisms that contribute to the uh, um, the, the, the uh, pneumonia complex. Manheimia, of course, the, the bacteria, the Histophilus. Viruses BVD, uh, PI3, IBR can all be found in different levels on different farms. Um, and of course, there are links between some of the viruses and some of the bacteria. But the mycoplasmas that we really are going to talk about are the mycoplasma bovis, but we shouldn't forget mycoplasma dispar, which is a, 
an increasingly um, isolated mycoplasma. The main problem is this one is quite difficult to detect. Um, so that may be why it's not picked up in, in routine um, um, in routine diagnosis. Mycoplasma canis um, has sort of raised its head every now and again. Again, it's quite easy to grow. So I think if it was there, you'd, you'd find it. So uh, again, keep an eye out for Mycoplasma canis because we've certainly isolated it from pneumonic herds. Now we think the bacteria are really not that important. They really uh, sort of reinforce or, or sort of um, that they're present in the nasal mucosa um, in fairly normal um, in, in, in healthy cattle. And it's really only when the immune system is disrupted um, by the presence of a virus or mycoplasma that you'll see uh, these bacteria. And as you say, as it says here, they contribute to the final progression to severe pneumonia. But they themselves on their own are really not a great problem. I think the problem over the years has been that there have been experts around the world who've, ch who've championed, if you like, different viruses. You know, we have people in the UK, BVD specialists, PI3 specialists, IBR, and I think they've tended to, uh, to, to sort of downgrade mycoplasmas, um, mainly because, you know, they, uh, it's not a particular interest of theirs, but I think we've developed sufficient. Um, I think we've developed sufficient uh, uh, progress to show that mycoplasmas really are are there and and should be studied, as is happening in eastern Turkey there with with Mehmet. You know, um, people are becoming aware of their importance, <clears throat> and it's. I think, as I said you'll find these different organisms in different balances in farms. So it's always going to be a challenge to, um, you know, to, to control these diseases because as I say, mycoplasma bovis will not always be there in, uh, in, in pure culture there or in, as a primary, uh, as the primary pathogen. But it's been uh, shown fairly well now that those herds which are, uh, suffering a low-grade pneumonia, perhaps caused by uh, some bacteria and, and viruses, uh, you'll see a greatly increased um, uh, disease as a result of the introduction of Mycoplasma bovis to those, uh, those farms. And you'll see increased morbidity and mortality as a result of uh, Mycoplasma bovis. Okay. Um, yeah, well, it's a worldwide problem now, mycoplasma bovis. Um, present in all cattle rearing countries. Until a few years ago, Finland and I think New Zealand were the only countries that managed to, uh, to stay free. But as you can see, it's a, as Guida, again, I apologize for the duplication, but um, um, this is the list of diseases that Mycoplasma bovis is associated with. So it's clearly, you know, an important pathogen. Uh, Guido mentioned mastitis, and, and really it's a bigger problem. Uh, Mycoplasma bovis mastitis is a bigger problem in uh, North America, in Canada and USA, in the large dairy herds, and probably some of the large dairy herds in, in the Middle East as well. Now, I was convinced, you know, um, uh, mycoplasma mastitis was being underplayed in the UK. I was sure, you know, people weren't looking for mycoplasmas in mastitis cases. And um, we carried out a survey of uh, many mastitic milk. And uh, I was, it was true that there wasn't really a problem at all in the UK. And it's really as a result of the fact that the biggest risk factor for mastitis, uh, mycoplasma mastitis, uh, is herd size. Anything above 400, 500 herd have a greater risk of, uh, of developing 
mastitis. In the UK, our herds are relatively small, so we don't really see it on a, on a regular basis. So that was uh, quite an instructive uh, for me. Um, again, we can see uh, pathology here. Guido described some of the, the pathology here, necrosis, uh, congestion of the apical lobes. We've got head tilt here, otitis, this animal, very healthy regardless, uh, but had this head tilt, permanent head tilt, as a result of otitis infection. I hope you can, with, I hope you can see here, the ear is badly infected. And this animal had was difficult to sell because of this uh, unusual posture. We just showed pictures of, of uh, arthritis and uh, keratoconjunctivitis again is seen often in the early stages of, uh, of bovis infection. And in fact, <clears throat> some people reckon, you know, the moment they see the ears tilting in a herd, in a young herd, um, they think this is really the first sign of mycoplasma bovis, and farmers really will uh, will swear that this is you know, the first sign of, of mycoplasma. So it's a very good uh, early diagnostic test, if you like. <clears throat> now, I say mycoplasma bovis was not really very well known until, I guess, you know, last 20 years. And then it suddenly appeared and people were talking about hidden killers in the herd, suddenly the mycoplasma had, had risen from, you know, an unknown pathogen to a killer. And of course, the newspapers all uh, jumped on this and, uh, you know, <laughs> and uh, the whole situation changed, luckily, because it then enabled companies like Pfizer to uh, start funding some research in this area on mycoplasma bovis. So, the, the newspapers can be quite useful sometimes. Now, I call this one the farm of death because this was one we visited in the north of England. And uh, this farm was suffering 25% mortality uh, year in, year out uh, as a result of mycoplasma bovis. And here, mycoplasma bovis was really seen um, as, as the... Uh, primary pathogen. There was bacteria there in post-mortem examination, but it was mycoplasma bovis that was causing the problem. And you can see really why, because this is virtually a cave. Here, these, there's no ventilation, uh, very poor um, <clears throat> environment. And uh, so the mycoplasma would spread around from and, and go from uh, calf to calf and resulting in, in huge losses. So this is extremely uh, bad. <clears throat> and in fact, now uh, recent surveys in the UK have shown that 30% of all isolates from diseased cattle in the last 10 years are in fact mycoplasma bovis. So it has risen. Um, it's always been there, but it's risen to quite significant levels now here and in the rest of the world. This is some of the, um, the pictures we've got from that, that awful farm. And there are quite a few of these farms, high mortality. And as Guido described so well, the caseous necrotic foci that, we were, that we're seeing here. Now, is this a new pathotype? I don't know. Um, you can see here, when we first saw this um, in the UK, um, it was a real shock, and some people even thought at the time it was possibly TB. I'm not a great expert, but um, um, it it really we'd we'd heard about this uh, new type of bovis uh, in the US. Then in northern Italy, we, it was seen this case is necrotic, and then it suddenly emerged uh, in the UK as well. And I think that's what really increased the uh, the awareness of mycoplasma bovis because it was killing. It wasn't just producing that uh, congestion of the lungs, of course, uh, but very, very severe, very severe disease. And I think this one now is, is virtually here to stay. It's a very serious uh, disease. <clears throat> just going back through some of the, the characteristics of, of mycoplasma bovis, uh, it does fulfill Cox postulates. That is, if you, isolate the mycoplasma and put it back into animals, it should 
cause disease, but not all of them do. They are incredibly variable. And uh, um, I'll say a little bit more about why I think uh, the mycoplasma strains we have are so variable. Um, most of these things I think you know, uh, most, it's the most common finding on consistently infected farm. Once mycoplasma gets into a farm, unless it's all out, in, all out, then the mycoplasma will stay in the, uh, on the farm and it will, the farm will be persistently infected. Now, one of the most interesting thing was that until the early 1990s, Ireland, which is, uh, you know, I think most of you know, Ireland, um, part of the United Kingdom or, or some parts of it, um, were free of mycoplasma bovis until the 1990s when we joined um, the EU. Uh, sadly, we've, we've left it now, but um, they, they'd imposed quite strict uh, controls uh, about what animals came into their country. But the moment we were in the open market, in the European market, then animals could move across borders without checks. And as a result, uh, Ireland became infected uh, in the early 1990s, and now just about a quarter of all pneumonias in cattle are caused by mycoplasma bovis. So that was, to me at least, you know, an indication of the importance of this mycoplasma. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about antibiotics, um, cause of arthritis and uh, uh, mastitis. I've always thought if you can get mastitis and arthritis um, together, then you, or um, pneumonia and arthritis, this is really good diagnostic um, uh, diagnosis of mycoplasma bovis. You don't need to do anything else, PCRs or whatever. I think those two, not in the same animal necessarily, but in the same herd, then um, you can virtually uh, say that this farm was suffering from mycoplasma uh, bovis on the basis of these clinical signs. Uh, the disease is spread really very, very uh, poorly, if you like, when you consider the other diseases like, uh, uh, you know, foot and mouth disease, things like that. It's only transmitted by close and repeated contact. Uh, there are, it can get into the semen. I'll say a bit more about that, that later on. Um, so the, the thing is, it can be controlled because of this very poor spread um, of, the, of the disease. It can be controlled. Uh, persistence in the environment, um, it's very closely related to mycoplasma agalactia, which is the cause of contagious agalactia. But we haven't seen the same um, evidence for persistence in the environment. When, I'm not aware of any situations where uh, freshly stocked herds have become infected from the environment. But maybe this is uh, another area that we need to look at. But I think in 100%, 90, all right, 99% of cases, it's close contact with other infected animals. That um, is the reason the disease spreads. Uh, one interesting area that uh, we, we only just came across a few years ago was um, the brain invasion. Um, and the mycoplasma can get into the brain in, in three ways, really. Uh, it can get into the bloodstream because inflammation uh, increases the permeability of the blood-brain barrier, BBB, the blood-brain barrier. It, mycoplasmas can get across. The problem was we didn't think they could, um, they could invade the cells. Um, but the more, more we're looking at, we realize that they can actually get inside, they can invade uh, the cells. Um, so that's, that's one area. Um, as I said, mycoplasmas get this otitis at the very early stages of infection. And um, you can see the damage to the inner ear can be, can be very, very severe. Um, here we've got this damaged ear here. And the mycoplasma may be able to get across into the inner ear and into the brain as a result of, of this damage. And then I'd say the intracellular invasion of host cells um, can uh, probably lead 
to the brain invasion. Why it's important, and this is a, a brain from France, uh, sorry, from Ireland, a uh, highly fibrotic brain, which originally was thought to be uh, this mad cow disease, um, BSE, bovine spongy form encephalopathy. And we think that quite a few of the early cases of uh, mad cow disease could well have been as a result of, of mycoplasma bovis. So that adds a different dimension uh, to, to this uh, organism, so a very severe uh, disease. Okay, so um, as I said, the mycoplasma uh, bovis has spread really across the world now. Um, and uh, we've got uh, New Zealand was the last country to become infected, 2017. And I'll say a little bit more about that. But you can see it first emerged probably in, in the US in 1962 here. And one of the first, it went across to Israel, we're pretty sure, in high pedigree animals, um, because Israel was trying to develop its uh, dairy industry. So that's probably, you know, the first uh, movement. And then it spread across the world. Did it spread or really is it just an indication of where uh, diagnostics came, uh, enabled the detection? of the disease. So in some cases it will be primary infection. In other cases, it's it's the fact that people are starting looking for it now. For example, China in 2008, I mean, I'm sure the disease was there, but it wasn't until then that people started to look for mycoplasma and detect them. So this isn't just the spread, it's really more about um, the, ab the ability of different countries to uh, detect and uh, isolate and detect mycoplasmas. And I mentioned here, this is 1993, when Ireland became infected following Britain's uh, um, uh, entry into the uh, EU. And now, bovis in, in Turkey, I, I started looking, I thought I'd have a quick look to see uh, when, when it was first reported in Turkey. Now, I may be wrong here, but I could only go back to 2008 when I was really surprised because um, uh, uh, a colleague, uh, Dr. Ongor, I, I don't know if he's listening today or if he's still active, but he sent me some isolates that he'd obtained from poultry. And um, he thought they were mycoplasma bovis and, uh, and we carried out um, uh, molecular diagnosis, and we could actually confirm that uh, if probably the first isolation or the first report of mycoplasma bovis in Turkey was, you know, in 2008. I'm sure they were around before that, and I'm sure maybe Umit was isolating them, perhaps she could tell me or not. Um, but anyway, the first published report was uh, was something that I was fortunately involved with. So I'm really um, quite uh, happy about that. But the first, um, I guess, report of respiratory problems uh, in Turkey uh, were by these workers. Um, and they reported this in 2010. Problems in the Eastern Turkey, probably somewhere near your institute, Mehmet, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Unfortunately, I am working for the government. Yeah, okay. Not only, but, not like uh, uh, for the university, I, I mean. Right, right. Anyway, so the Eastern, uh, so I think these are the only reports. I hope I'm, perhaps people could uh, uh, tell me differently that perhaps there was reports of mycoplasma bovis in Turkey before this. I'm sure there were, but uh, the report, perhaps it was published in uh, Turkish paper, uh, news, uh, journal. And this is in fact the, um, the, uh, the gel that I use to isolate these uh, mycoplasma bovis from chickens. And uh, this technique is called PCR DGGE. I don't know if many of you are familiar with this particular technique. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, it's the method of choice for us in the, uh, in the UK. We use this method a lot. Guido, I know, uses it. Uh, laboratories in the north of Italy also use this. Um, it's a little fussy, but once it's 
set up. It's, it's really good. For example, here, these are the isolates. This is a, a gel that the DNA has been, uh, we use a PCR against the 16S RNA. And the gel, uh, the DNA ru runs down the gel to, to a point close to its melting point. And uh, what we do is we run a bunch of controls here. And you can see these isolates here uh, are identical to this isolate here, which is Mycoplasma bovis. So that's how we do. We compare uh, controls with, with the isolates. And uh, one of the great things about this technique is that it, it can detect minor sequence variations. It's very, very sensitive. You can, you can detect mixed cultures. For example, you can, uh, you can see two different mycoplasmas in the same gel, which is really quite unique. Um, we can detect uncultivable mycoplasma. These are mycoplasmas that don't grow or don't grow very well, um, possibly like the old uh, hemoplasmas. Uh, they can be detected in this system. And in fact, you know, new mycoplasmas, um, for example, perhaps this is a, a new mycoplasma here. We can sequence this one and, uh, and then uh, do a 16S sequencing and... Um, identify the organism. So it's quite a unique uh, method of diagnosis. Um, as I say, it's, it's in routine use in the UK and in other countries. <clears throat> so Mycoplasma bovis in, uh, in New Zealand, uh, as I said, New Zealand was always proud of the fact that uh, it had a very good um, uh, control. Uh, it didn't import cattle, it hadn't import cattle for something like 10, 20 years. And I think the last cattle, there were a group of high pedigree animals from Australia about 20 years before. But then in 19, in 2017, they detected Mycoplasma bovis for the first time. And you can see um, in 2018, 23 farms were infected. They started to increase. And about this time, a committee of people, including myself, was brought in to assess the situation. You know, could it be controlled? Should we leave it? Should we just allow it to 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 spread through New Zealand uh, dairy industry and and cattle industry? Um, but the decision was made to eradicate because at the time the number of farms were fairly small, but. Um, New Zealand had a very uh, curious husbandry system. And uh, by uh, 2023, over 26, uh, over, uh, sorry, um, 2,600 farms were infected. So it really mushroomed. And part of the, uh, the problem was that it produced very few clinical signs. And uh, I think now, if I'd known that, I perhaps wouldn't have been quite so anxious or enthusiastic about eradication, because as you can see here, they've paid out over 236 million pounds in euro. It's a huge exercise, especially for a, a disease that is not OIE listed. Um, in fact, there are no countries in the world that notifiable disease, but they decided to make this um, decision. And they're almost there, they're almost there to, um, to have completely eradicated the disease. But what still surprises me, um, yeah, the disease was supposed to have entered New Zealand about one to two years before it detected. It wasn't producing these, this respiratory disease that, that we, have, we know so well in, in, um, in the rest of the world. It wasn't producing respiratory disease. Um, we think there was a single source of the infection, looking, this is molecular typing. They've done an awful lot of uh, whole genome sequencing. And they can show that basically it was a single source of infection because most of the isolates are, are very, very similar. And it may have entered three times in a small, um, in, a, in a small period of time. And uh, I was convinced you know, right from the go um, that semen, because that's the only biological material that, um, that New Zealand um, imports, and it actually imported from Europe, probably from from uh, from uh, 
the Netherlands. Um, there was also, you know, some evidence that DNA relating to mycoplasma both was I was detected in semen, but was not isolated. But people seem very reluctant. Perhaps you can tell me why that to blame semen for for an infection, and it could be because of the way the mycoplasma entered New Zealand through artificial insemination that the disease never manifested itself in the way we see it in the rest of the world with the mastitis and um, and the pneumonia and the arthritis. None of that's been seen. Most of the disease is sort of reproductive problems, um, uh, small infections in, in, the, in the cattle. So, um, you know, it, it's been quite a mystery really. Um, but it looks close to being eradicated. But I wonder whether the cost was worth it because you know we've seen very, very few clinical cases. So a bit of a mystery, but um, anyway, um, you know, good luck to, to New Zealand for having close, having got to eradication so closely. I don't think many other, you could recommend this approach to any other countries because of the widespread nature of the uh, of mycoplasma burden. I don't think, uh, I think, you know, a start is to do seroprevalence studies. If it is located in areas, then maybe eradication is a possibility. But um, I think, you know, seroprevalence studies are, are vital before one takes a decision to uh, uh, how to control the disease. So going on to the control of, of mycoplasma diseases, um, <clears throat> now you can prevent introduction and uh, it's a sort of message we've got across, we tried to get across to farmers in the UK that you can prevent, if your farm is free of mycoplasma bovis, you can keep it that way. Um, you know, maybe ideally you should do sero, you know, you should do seropositive you should do serological tests on the animals you're intended to buy before you take them in, or at least keep them in quarantine until you're sure that they're not infected. So it's an easy disease to keep out. Um, although, you know, with the cattle movements around the, the world now, um, on a national basis, it's probably impossible. But on a farm to farm basis, buying in mycoplasma bovis free cat cattle is possible. So again, the cheapest uh, way of, uh, of controlling bovis. Husbandry, sanitary measures, while well, increasing ventilation, uh, reducing, um, you know, populations in the, in the, um, in the farm. Again, all of these things are, are useful, um, but, you know, once bovis is there, it, it's extremely difficult to eradicate. Eradication, uh, vaccines and chemotherapy, of course, are the other uh, three ways of, of controlling the disease. And of course, eradication and the use of vaccines really is, um, is based on prevalence. I mean, I think if you're considering controlling the, the disease, then you need to know where it is. And if it's located in small areas, then, you know, it may be possible to, to use one of these methods. Uh, optimally to, to control the disease. So these are the, the three main ways. Now, uh, we, I don't think we quite discussed this, but I think you're all aware that uh, mycoplasmas bovis is, is, is uh, becoming resistant to so many different antibiotics now. Uh, it's almost untreatable. I think most people would, would agree uh, it, it's getting close to that. Um, this is over 16 years, and you can see we've got resistance to tilmycosin, although it was always a seemed to be a problem. Tylosin, oxytet is now not very useful. Even we're even seeing um, resistance to some of the fluoroquinolones, which is extremely worrying because you know we need these antibiotics for for human. Uh, the last line of defense, if you like, for, for many human infections. So we really are in a, a desperate situation. Um, 
and this is the more, more recent data. I hope you can you can see it. Um, again, you 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 know you you're getting uh, resistance here uh, to enrofloxacin. Um, Tylosin, of course, is no longer any use at all. Oxytetracycline, and th but these two, these are the new the Draxin, uh, which Pfizer have um, you know made a, a claim that this one will, um, despite the high MIC values, uh, they believe it, it will control the disease, suggesting that some of these antibiotics use other methods. Um, uh, to uh, to kill bacteria and and to kill mycoplasmas, such as you know um, increasing in higher concentrations in the lung, for example. Um, so there are, and of course, the uh, immune system is also can be uh, brought in to help these uh, antibiotics as well. So this is a very complex area, but I think you'll agree, you know, that we are really running out of options on the chemotherapy front for mycoplasma bovis. So what are we left with? We're left with, uh, with vaccines really, which of course, um, I guess is why we're, why we're here. And, um, but we've got a real challenge, I think, with mycoplasma bovis. An ideal vaccine, of course, this is the uh, hypothetical case, uh, should be safe, should be stable, uh, to be a single shot, if possible, long duration of immunity, and high levels of protection. Well, I'm not sure there are many vaccines that really that use today, which uh, um, you know reach all those those targets. But the unfortunate problem is that mycoplasmas, you know, make things worse. They provoke generally provoke low levels of antibody, and the antibodies don't often very rarely correlate with protection. Um, the, uh, there's obviously some autoimmunity going on because mycoplasma bovis can sometimes uh, excite huge levels of cell-mediated and humoral uh, immune system, but without actually protecting the, the animal. We've got antigenic variability. The mycoplasma can change its uh, surface antigens at will virtually. So the, micro the immune system doesn't fails to recognize the mycoplasma. Biofilm, uh, we've, we've, we've uh, we demonstrated mycoplasma to produce biofilms, which again, protect the mycoplasma from the immune system and indeed from, from antibiotics. And I think we lack good challenge models. Um, we spend a lot of time looking to produce uh, good calf models, but um, often they were uh, were not very robust, very variable, very difficult to compare one experiment with another. So these are the downsides uh, to producing a vaccine. And now, <clears throat> there has been, you know, quite a long time ago, I think some people in the, in the UK at the Compton Institute recognized Mike, we were the first to recognize that mycoplasmas were a problem in the uh, in the field. And uh, they came interested. And I think they took right from the word go, they took the right decision. They developed a vaccine incorporating the major pathogens of, of pneumonia. So you had uh, RSV, you had PI3, we had bovis, and I thought very far-sightedly, they also incorporated uh, mycoplasma dispar because uh, their work had shown that mycoplasma bovis and dispars were important uh, pathogens in the respiratory uh, disease. But um, but what they did was they actually used the, the uh, they carried out surveys they carried out the trials directly in um, herds in the field. So these weren't experimental models. They anticipated um, in the winter there'd be pneumonia cases. So they vaccinated half and un uh, didn't vaccinate the other half. And then just saw what happened. And uh, with this multivalent vaccine, they, uh, they, they got 40% protection. Um, 
it during one winter uh, based on treatment reduction. So clearly, you know, if you're not having to uh, treat well uh, so often, then this is a, a plus for, for the farmer, you know, reduced antibiotic usage. Uh, in a, but in a particularly uh, bad winter, they actually showed 69 protect, protection during a major outbreak. I think it was of RSV and Mycoplasma bovis at the same time. So this work showed tremendous promise, but sadly, um, the group broke up uh, for various reasons, probably funding problems, and uh, it was really left for another 10, 20 years for people to uh, resurrect this work. <laughs> the problem with Mycoplasma bovis, as I said, is that they can confound uh, your expectations. And here, a um, couple of workers in Northern Ireland and uh, I think Poland, using purified proteins actually made the situation worse. Um, you've got huge high levels of IgG, but no protection whatsoever, but just an exacerbation of the disease. And indeed, uh, these people actually used it as a method of, uh, as a, as a challenge model, they'd prime the uh, animals with these purified proteins and you'd get a worse disease. So this is certainly not the way forward. This purified approach wasn't the way for, forward, at least not uh, this type of uh, approach. Um, there have been uh, a number of vaccines produced in the US uh, with very little um, uh, trials, but very little data. Um, but there was one trial here uh, in 2011 that showed two autogenous vaccines, a commercially available vaccine. One had 44% effective, which is not bad. The other one was completely ineffective. And this is not, you know, surprising. I mean, all these vaccine manufacturers have to produce, uh, have to prove is that the vaccine is safe. And I think we've seen that with contagious agalactia uh, in Italy, you know, some of the vaccines are just, um, you know, just useless. They're, they're, they're no good at all. So uh, again, this isn't, wasn't great. But, um, one, one, uh, what, sorry, sorry, a little. Um, this, um, this is the latest of these, um, vaccines, which is actually imported into the UK in a limited trial. Um, and the difference with this one was that it had three strains. I don't know, I don't know the thinking behind it, but I guess they found they did molecular typing or serotyping and, and chose three strains which were sufficiently, sufficiently different in order uh, to provide a, a, a larger range of immunity. They Reckon it's a one dose vaccine uh, and it's for both respiratory and arthritic forms of disease. And they use a superior antigen, adjuvant, whichever, which whatever that is. Um, and the company's own results claim 10% less deaths, 15% uh, less morbidity uh, in, in quite a large study. But they vaccinated in uh, wait till the animals were over two months of age. They, know, they also uh, found that the, uh, they, they got uh, economic benefits by the number of reduced deaths that they, uh, they again, this hasn't been um, scrutinized by peer review. So I think like with any commercial um, vaccine, we have to take it, we say here with a pinch of salt, you know, we have to be uh, a little careful about um, how important these are. It's being trialed in the in the UK at the moment. Um, this is the uh, again, this is the company's data showing, you know, um, less sickness, uh, less sickness in the uh, with with the vaccine. Uh, here's another. This one has less deaths. Still very high. I mean, you you can see the how uh, how. Um, Severe mycoplasma bovis can be with, with this level that farmers are sustaining this level of loss. Uh, in the UK, um, 
a trial again which hasn't been published but something I've, I've been familiar with again showed some improvement some um, less uh, uh, post weaning mortality in calves age three to six months and again a significant reduction in microbial usage which I think has got to be a good thing not just you know reducing uh, deaths and mortality but you know, if you can use less antibiotics, then of course that's going to be a good thing. But I'm sort of a bit worried that um, I think vaccinating after two months is too late because many of these animals are already sick, uh, are dying well before for this. So how you protect these younger calves is, is going to be a challenge. How am I doing for time, Mehmet? Is that okay? We're okay for time? Yes, yes, we have. We don't have any time. We have. We don't have any problem with time. Excellent. Yeah. Good. Okay. It's yeah. probably much longer, but um, okay. So, um, uh, saponized vaccines. Um, saponin is a, is a very interesting uh, plant-based um, extract. Um, it has been used as an adjuvant. And interestingly, it can lyse cholesterol-rich membranes of molecules, mycoplasmid. It does have a very uh, delicate, very subtle way of inactivating mycoplasmas without, as Guido was saying, you know, formalin can destroy these epitopes um, very easily. Um, but saponin works in a slightly more subtle way. It, it produces little pores in the, uh, the membrane. So, um, you know, the mycoplasma really stays immunologically intact. So, uh, again, um, it's very, very useful. Um, it is cytotoxic. I have to be very careful. It can cause uh, problems. Um, but purified saponin don't appear to be that effective. There seems to be, I don't know, some contaminant in in the saponin, which uh, which is is which you need to inactivate uh, the the mycoplasma. It will cause uh, problems if uh, the concentration is too high. It seems to have been first used for CCPP vaccines in the in East Africa, contagious caprine, pleuronemonia, and. Um, I think it, it's a pretty successful vaccine and it's it's still um, being used today, uh, although you know CCPP is, is quite widespread. Um, in uh, Tola in Sardinia, uh, had a look at a range of um, different inactivants and she found that the formalin um, was very good at inactivating mycoplasma agalactia. Um, and it was better, uh, saponin was better than other inactivants as heat killed or, or formalin because of the subtle action. So I think the balance has to be, but the balance must be struck between its mycoplasmicidal activity and the cytotoxic effect. If you use too little, you don't get decent adjuvant. And if you use too much, then you, you can cause uh, problems, uh, adverse reactions in the animals. Well, we used, we started, we thought, well, hang on a minute, you know, maybe agalactia is very similar to, to mycoplasma bovis. Let's use, uh, um, let's use saponin for a mycoplasma bovis vaccine. And uh, I mean, this trial is, is, is pretty old now. And was carried out in Hungary, um, where they had a very good challenge model, an aerosol challenge model. This is the problem, is, is, is getting a consistent um, challenge model. But uh, Dr. Uh, Laszlo Stipkowicz, who sadly died uh, earlier last year, uh, was uh, an expert in um, challenge experiments. And um, we went there to, to carry out some of this uh, uh, preliminary work. So we inactivated our mycoplasma bovis with uh, with saponin and vaccinated uh, calves in his facility. And then challenged three weeks later with quite a high 
uh, challenge, a virulent Hungarian challenge. The thing was, our strain and the, uh, the vaccine strain and the Hungarian challenge were quite different. So it wasn't a homologous challenge that some people I've noticed in their reports have, been, have used. And I imagine, you know, um, uh, that would certainly make the vaccine um, look better than it probably was if you use a homologous vaccine strain and challenge. Uh, so uh, we got good serological response with uh, with our two vaccinated uh, groups. This one we kept. We didn't uh, we didn't challenge. We just wanted to see how long the immune system, the immune uh, response, would go on for. In fact, it went on for about six months. But here we we challenged uh, our vaccinated group. We had some control groups as well. Um, so good antibody response after challenge. You could see that the, the challenge also brought about an increase in immune response. Um, it's too a bit too too soon to say, but as you can see here, this was a vaccinated, uh, unchallenged. Um, uh, sorry, <laughs> can't see. Um, this is um, the unvaccinated group unvaccinated challenge group and you can see the weight is beginning to reduce um, here with the vaccinated animals growth rates were maintained but even after three weeks I think you can just see a, a, a slight uh, tail off uh, of course that would become um, more obvious if we let the experiment run on further so again growth rates were good <clears throat> but when we look at the um, the percentage of the lung affected, this was a control group, so it wasn't uh, challenged. Here we have the non-vaccinated challenge group, and you can see 20% mean of the lungs were, um, were affected, whereas the vaccinated challenge had much less um, damage to, to the lungs, which of course, you know, is, is highly beneficial because uh, Anything affects the lungs also affects growth rate. So there was a significant difference between the vaccinated challenge and the non-vaccinated group. Um, so we were quite interested to, to do a challenge, do a contact infection as well. And uh, here um, we, we, we took uh, 30 animals, we kept them all in the same airspace, and uh, we vaccinated this one at the at day zero, if you like. And then three weeks later, we uh, challenged 10 animals here. Um, and uh, we, we didn't vaccinate here. So what we were looking to see is, is the contact infection from, from here, from the uh, challenged animal to the vaccinated and to the non-vaccinated group. So slightly sophisticated uh, uh, way of uh, of challenging, but because this is the natural method, it's it's not you know putting ten to the eight uh, mycoplasmas down the throat uh, isn't realistic in many ways. But but by contact challenge, uh, we thought this would simulated the situation far better in the uh, in on the farm. And again, the vaccinated group here this is damage to lung much less damage to the lung than the unvaccinated challenge and the unvaccinated contact animals. So the disease spread to the unvaccinated animals um, and um, the vaccinated animals were protected significantly from this challenge. And then the mean body weight, you can see that the vaccinated animals uh, had good growth rates, whereas the two, uh, uh, unvaccinated animals uh, groups uh, didn't. So, you know, this was encouraging for us. And, um, you know, in summary, um, we had a good re antibody response. It, we also found that the disease, the mycoplasma didn't spread uh, as well in the vaccinated animals to the inner organs. And the antibody response uh, remained high for six months. So we were really encouraged by this. Um, and vaccinating young at three weeks of age uh, would get the calves over perhaps the most susceptible uh, period. Um, 
in that early stage. However, when we tried to commercially exploit this with various commercial companies, we weren't able to, uh, um, to re reproduce those results. We felt it was because of their poor challenge model. Um, but anyway, this is, I, I st so we still carried on with this vaccine as an autogenous vaccine. Uh, because we felt uh, we wanted to know how the disease, how the vaccine would uh, uh, would appear in in the natural conditions. So, um, <clears throat> although we didn't have commercial, uh, we got a patent for the, for the vaccine, but we we couldn't get commercial um, support. Uh, so we went ahead and just produced autogenous vaccines. We took strains from the farm and then uh, inactivated with saponin using the same uh, techniques. And we carried out a range of, uh, um, we carried out a range of trials in, across Europe, in UK, Spain, Italy, and even in, in, in Turkey as well. Um, so if I could just show you just really uh, some results from those trials. Um, they're not uh, weren't always going to be successful because we don't know what major pathogen was active at that particular moment, and this is really the challenge for for uh, bovis vaccine is that it won't always you won't always have mycoplasma bovis present. So um, I remove, ah, that's better. Um, so if you can look at this, this is a, a study we did. Guido mentioned the white veal calves, which are kept in very close condition. We thought this vaccine would benefit from there. Um, and this was uh, a non-vaccinated group and a vaccinated group, all sharing the same airspace, um, mean lung score. You know, here there's very little difference significantly between the vaccinated and non-vaccinated group, apart from the number of animals with pleuritis, there was significant reduction in number of animals showing um, pleuritis. Weights again, no significant difference between between the weights. So we carried out another study, another part of northern Italy, um, and here we had a slight increase in uh, mean weight here. Uh, there we go here. Uh, number of animals, um, again with pleuritis, was, was reduced in the uh, vaccinated group. And there was a slight difference in the number of animals affected, although mean lung scores weren't, uh, um, were not significant. Finally, in Northern England, uh, in fact, at that farm I showed you earlier, where these animals were dying at quite high numbers, um, we, we did, uh, again, we did another trial, and um, these are the number of animals that we, we, we used in the trial. Um, and you can see here, number of calves that were treated with antibiotics, that's a total number. Um, it was very little difference, very little difference, but there was a reduction in the number of, of deaths uh, in, in that group. Now, the problem was with this farm, they were getting their calves from across the road in a mastitis, uh, sorry, in a, in a dairy farm where mycoplasma bovis was, was clearly a problem. So the calves were arriving. Uh, some of them were animals were, were already sick. So what we thought we'd do is to treat them first before vaccinating. And uh, although numbers were very, very small, uh, number of treatments, um, okay, yeah, it's a much smaller group, but the percentage of deaths that we saw in the vaccinate, in the treated vaccinated group was significant. And again, that might be an approach that some farms may have to take is that they treat, I mean, in fact, I think actually a lot of calves are treated anyway because of the stress caused by, by movements. Right, uh, just a, another one here. Um, this was one um, where the vet was, was really encouraged because um, 
basically what happened here, you have two winters, 2006, 2007. This, animal, these, this farm was experiencing 21% losses year in, year out. Here, the year after, 24%. So we began to vaccinate these animals uh, late in this uh, in the in the winter, and you can see the vaccination actually brought about huge reduction in the number of deaths in in uh, in, in this particular farm. And I think number of uh, the, the Europe, number of uh, the amount of money spent on antibiotic treatment was also significantly reduced, which really pleased the farmer a lot. So, in certain circumstances, you know, the use of vaccine can be highly beneficial. I, I think I've said enough about that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so under certain circumstances, it's not always going to work. It's always going to depend on what is prevailing, uh, what is the pneumonia, the, the organisms involved in pneumonia prevailing at that particular, that year. So that's, that's, that's going to be the problem. Now, Kasia Dudek uh, in Poland uh, was quite impressed with our saponin work and sort of taken it a little stage further. And she's, she's published quite a bit of this work. She uses the same technique with saponin, but she's using um, an adjuvant, this emulsogen, which she thinks is, uh, provides a much stronger antibody response than just saponin on its own. And uh, she challenged, again, they, they carried out a ex vaccine experiment using 23 mils, quite a lot of uh, intratracheal inoculation of 10 to the 8. But it's a homologous strain. As I said earlier, I think um, this is, has to be taken uh, a little bit with caution because the vaccine strain and the uh, um, challenge strain is, was the same. So um, anyway, their results, they found they got good results. They said the upper respiratory tract colonization, nasal shedding was reduced. Uh, they got anti good antibody response, reduction in lesions, uh, good antibody response, and even cell-mediated cell immunity was, uh, was increased. So, um, as I said, you know, I think that they're moving ahead with, with that vaccine. The Polish are moving ahead with that vaccine, and they've got some uh, trials ahead. Um, I think they do need to, I think, use a different strain for challenge than, than what they've been using. So what about live vaccines? Now, I'm a great proponent of, of live vaccines for for. Um, for mycoplasmas, we know the CBPP vaccine, the only vaccine that's ever been shown to work is a live vaccine. It's an attenuated strain, mildly virulent. Um, and uh, I think in, in the poultry industry, um, they also uh, uh, use live vaccines. And I believe uh, in Pendic as well, I know in Pendic that they've also used uh, live vaccines with, with very good effect. I believe for uh, mycoides capri. Um, and I think uh, really we shouldn't lose uh, sight of these live vaccines because they really do uh, stimulate good responses. Um, of course, there's safety issues as well. Uh, we need to uh, be careful of. But they're cheaper to produce. They're very immunogenic, they're protective. Uh, and indeed, in, I say in, in China as well, a vaccine, uh, I hear it is, yeah. The, the Chinese have been trialing two live uh, serially passage mycoplasma bovis vaccine at passage 150 and passage 180. So they've been doing a lot of passaging. Uh, they got enormous challenge, three, um, three doses of 10 to the 10, which is quite extraordinary in my opinion. Uh, but based on their results, uh, they, they get very, very good protection. I think, again, I think we have to be a little bit cautious, um, you know, to get that levels of protection um, with that massive dose. Um, but anyway, I, I, I think live vaccines uh, really do are the future for particularly mycoplasma bovis, which is so widespread. 
it really wouldn't uh, cause huge problem. Now, <clears throat> many well, a few years ago now, I guess 10, 15 years ago, I had a PhD student um, who uh, was looking at hydrogen peroxide. And we know hydrogen peroxide is linked to that coagulative necrotic lesions that we see with mycoplasma bovis now. And these are different strains. He took a range of different strains and he was able to show that some strains had really massive levels of hydrogen peroxide when, when undergoing metabolism and some very little at all. Uh, and there's a possibility that the variation in pathogenicity we see with mycoplasma bovis may be related to hydrogen uh, peroxide levels. And I believe that these new strains that were which are producing these uh, very severe lesions do produce large quantities of hydrogen peroxide. But again, this is work that really needs to be done, I think. Uh, perhaps this is uh, something that uh, Mehmet could, could, could look at because uh, sadly this work stopped at King's College in London um, following uh, changes in staff. So again, I think this is a, an important um, feature. Um, <clears throat> so basically what we did, what, what uh, Ali Khan did, my student, uh, he passed out, he started to pass out these strains as, uh, you know, uh, as people do, and uh, found that on passaging, you know, by 100 passage, the amount of hydrogen peroxide produced was, was really significantly down on the, uh, on the original strain. And when we looked at the SDS page, we could see that after uh, about 50 passages, we'd lost a band here, uh, a protein band here, which we identified as NADH oxidase, which is a, an enzyme in the, uh, the uh, metabolism uh, which produces hydrogen peroxide. So by multi-passaging this uh, mycoplasma bovis strain, we produced uh, what we thought was an attenuated uh, strain. Uh, we weren't able to do uh, cattle work because of, of the expense, um, but we did manage to find uh, um, a company that would do this type of, do the experimental infection. And sadly, again, <laughs> like the first time, they weren't able to reproduce these results. But again, I'm sure, you know, in the right hands, this, uh, this type of um, attenuation strain um, could be tested. So finally, this is my final slide. Um, as I said before, um, <clears throat> mycoplasma bovis vaccines are a challenge because success will vary on every farm and every season, as each will have a different combination of pathogens. You know, we have good years and bad years as far as pneumonia is concerned, linked to the weather, no doubt. So it's not going to be a, a consistent uh, picture. The vaccines are very effective. I think we've seen in some of the trials we did where MBOV is, is the single or the major pathogen on that, uh, on that farm. It will work. So it will work, I think, dramatically well in some cases. Again, good diagnosis is, is very important uh, to assess what strains are, are present on, on a farm. Uh, again, it'll be very useful, very good where the uh, challenge vaccine strain are homologous, but I think this is very rare, it's very unlikely to happen. But I think that the important thing is that I think bovis should be given as part of a multivalent BRD vaccine, just as those far-sighted people at Compton did in the early 1980s putting all the major pathogens together because a single pathogen is, I don't think is going to work consistently enough. And perhaps disbar as well. I think uh, people need to really look to find, uh, to identify mycoplasma disbar. And again, I think, um, you know, one should really consider a live vaccine for mycoplasma bovis. I think that that's it. And then I, 
that should say happy days, I think. I think my original thing said happy birthday, but Mutlu Samanla, I think, was happy days at Pendik all those years ago. Bishikallah. Thank you very much. Thank you for the valuable presentation, Dr. Robin. Good. <laughs> okay, uh, I think uh, there is um, there is a person that wants to ask a question for you, Imit. Name is Imit. Okay. First of all, thank you very much, both of you, for this great presentation. Robin, you mentioned that the mycoplasma bob is, uh, is persistence in heart. Uh, when it comes, it can be person. Person. Um, we can say that all mycoplasma same thing exists. Uh, why we can not eradicate this strain? What is the reason this? And uh, any vaccination can affect on this person to condition. <laughs> can can you repeat? I I hold on. I just. Put on my, uh, my sound is very poor. First of all, thank you very much for a great presentation, both of you. Um, you mentioned that the bob is, is persons, persons in the heart. When it comes, it can be persons. Uh, we can say that all mycoplasma, same thing about exists. Uh, what is the reason of this person? Why we cannot eradicate this strain? And uh, about vaccination, uh, is there any effect vaccination on this? Thank you. Why can't we uh, eradicate um, mycoplasma bovis? I mean, I, th I think we can, you know, I think uh, really to prevent the organism coming onto a farm. I think it's possible, um, but many farmers are not very careful. They go to the market, they see a, a fine calf and they buy it and they bring it. They don't, don't take any precautions. They, they look straight at the, uh, they, they buy the calf and then the disease spreads. It's, um, I think it's somehow inevitable, but um, I think nationally, I think it's possible. Um, in Ireland, um, after there was, uh, they slaughtered many animals because of BSC, they decided that they would buy, they would increase their national herd by buying in animals which were free of specific diseases. And one of the diseases was Mycoplasma bovis. And uh, they were able to use serological methods to um, bring together a bovis free herd. I'm not sure the situation now because it was a, a few years ago. Perhaps they they did become reinfected again. But um, so and this, the second question was. Okay, is there any questions, Dr. Ben? Sorry, I. Uh, the vaccination. Okay, it's sorry. On this persistence. What? Sorry, pers I don't. The persistence. persistence. Sorry? Um, persistence. Persistent. It, we cannot remove from the worm. It can, it can stay persistent. Persistent. Ah, yeah. sorry. Persistent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> no, no. Um, the vaccination. What is the vaccination effect on this persistence condition? Yeah, I. Uh, persistent. Uh, can we mention that the variable surface protein? I think, you know, it, it doesn't survive very well in the environment. I, I, I don't think it, I think we did find, uh, we did find some in the environment um, in Italy. I think we, we did a PCR, we, we did some swabbing of walls and things and we, we found it there. But I don't think it's enough. I really don't think it's enough mycoplasma there to, to persist. The animal, the, the mycoplasma persists because the animals spread the disease to each other. And um, if you can have an all in, all out system where, you know, and then you have a, a space, uh, you have a time when the animals, when the farm is free, I think uh, you could um, get rid of this um, 
you could stop it being persistent. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is there any more question to Dr. Robin? Uh, I would ask one more question. Uh, thank you for you, your valuable presentation. Really, I learned so many things. I am new learner for the vaccination technologies and uh, adjuvants. So that is why I would ask, like you mentioned, when we saponized the vaccine, and it is better than uh, formalin or inactivation with the heat. So if we are using sapon sapon saponize, so you are. I mean, it it's, it does it it means like we are destroying the bac bacteria cell or. I mean, what's going on when we use saponize? Can you give a bit information about that? I am not super familiar about the saponize. That is why I am asking. Yeah, I mean, as I said, it, it's a, a very subtle um, inactivant. It, it seems to cause small pores in the mycoplasma. It inactivates, uh, but keeps the... Uh, the surface architecture intact. I think it's a it's a very subtle uh, way. I think um, Guido, do you remember the the saponin? We started using saponin for agalactia yeah, vaccines yeah. many years ago, exactly. and uh, we sometimes had some problems. But um, exactly, you you are right. Um, saponin, uh, you know, attack the 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 the, the cholesterol cholesterol molecule of the membrane. So just disrupt, disrupt the mycoplasma, leaving all the antigen, uh, you know, intact. So that's very good. The only problem I, I, I observed, there's some time, because uh, saponin is a detergent, so it's like a soap, you know. Maybe it create a kind of, uh, you know, resistant stage of mycoplasma. So maybe <coughs> when we when we perform sterility test for two three weeks is negative, then get again positive. So the the utilization of saponin as inactivant must be really properly done because could get the risk to not to inactivate definitely like formalin does the, the antigen. This is the only constraint. Yeah. But the immune effect, it's fantastic. It's really, really strong. It's at least from the antibodies point of view, when you inoculate with the saponin uh, treated antigen, you have a fantastic arising of antibodies imitating the disease. So it should be, you know, encouraging for for future vaccine. There is one, uh, you know, <clears throat> industry, one uh, vaccine factory in Italy, which does it for for Mycoplasma galatia. Uh, it's uh, the Fatro pharmaceutical firm. They say it's inactivated by saponin, but I don't know if they does it, but then they utilize also something to kill definitely the antigen. I don't know, that, just, just to understand. Thank you. Okay. I have. I, I would add one more question. So you mentioned uh, in the farm, especially in a calves, um, older than like two months, let's say this uh, animals is sick because of the mycoplasma bovis. So when we apply any vaccine for these animals? Do you think it can be better to use antibiotic or, I mean, what can be happen? It's inevitable that you're going, I mean, I think it's inevitable that you're going to vaccinate animals which are, which are sick. I mean, I think Guido and I, we, we wrote a paper about the impact of a, a vaccine on a sick, heard. I mean, theoretically, you 
they always say, you know, vaccinate healthy animals, you know. Um, oh, but question. there seemed to be some evidence that even vaccinating sick animals can bring about a, a recovery. Um, I think it certainly needs uh, further work. But, but I mean, the problem we found with many farms was that these animals were coming onto the farm coughing already. You know, they were already sick. Um, and I think the only way you can you can handle that situation is by treating with with antibiotics, you know, at, at the outset. Um, otherwise, I don't think they, they stand a chance in, at that at that early age. Um, Osman Hocam is here. Uh, Osman Hocam, who is the main expert in vaccination technology in Turkey. Uh, I hope he can say some words to us or uh, even question doesn't matter. We would be happy to hear his sound. Firstly, I thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Nicholas, you remember me? Uh, not open. Your micro not... I remember you in uh, my first trip to Turkey in 1991, I think it was. <laughs> I do remember you. I enjoyed well, my first trip to Turkey very much. I, uh, I learned for the first time saponin inactivation from your, uh, your article. Okay, yeah. So, uh, Two thousand seven, uh, at the big farm uh, east of the Turkey, Adaba, uh, Adaba Farms, third one city. There was a, a, a new infection, but not know the uh, effect or which is the uh, agent. So this, uh, we asked some samples from uh, farms, especially mastitis symptoms. We isolate mycoplasma boris. Ah. Yeah, about 60, 16 years ago. Uh, you, according to your method, we prepared autovaxin. Not only mycoplasma also, but other mastitis agents, uh, about six months later, the problem solved. Uh, Dr. Mehmet uh, asked uh, a question about antibiotic treatment or vaccine application uh, during the uh, infection. So six months later, Adama Farm sent sent me about three kilogram bata. <laughs> Then about three years later, uh, a European part of the Turkey, uh, Tekirda, Lüneburgas, uh, a government farm. The government farm bring to animals for Turkey from Europe. But there was a problem. There was a big problem to all the uh, Turkey the farm, the government farm, uh, mastitis, arthritis problem. Uh, also, we prepare a combined vaccine for mycoplasma and other mastitis agents. Also, two or three months later, uh, the institute director uh, called me, thank you very much, because uh, our milk production is uh, high, money is well, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we take Uh, uh, animals from Europe because uh, first farm uh, imported animals. So, 
uh, Otovaxin. Again, I say thank you very much, Dr. Nicholas. Uh, we learned saponin inactivation from you. Because formalin inactivation destroyed the mycoplasma antigens. Saponin uh, inactivation for the growth method for mycoplasma inactivated vaccine. If we prepare uh, attenuate the mycoplasma strains, maybe better. Ama, but but mycoplasma bonus strain is very di different genetic profiles. Uh, okay, thank you very much. I can't take too much credit, I think, for the saponin. It was fairly well known for Agalactia, which is very similar to Bovis. So I think I was very lucky, you know, to... Uh, uh, but I think, you know, Guido's experience, I think, with the homolo with the uh, saponin vaccine for both. Did you use saponin, Guido? Yeah, as, uh, as protection, I think, is the best one. Yeah. I think the best one ever we tried in comparison with the phenol, phenol inactivated, uh, uh, formalin inactivated, heat inactivated, tri tritonix inactivated. Uh, it was the one, at least in the small group of sheep we tested, uh, together with the live uh, vaccine done by Pendic Institute. They were the best in terms of uh, clinical, you know, performance. So really animal uh, you know get a very good score in, uh, so i think uh, it's it's very promising answers we we also should uh, should understand you know better how to manage to maybe mixing some pathogens together as you mentioned maybe some virus like interstitial virus or manahemia together because sometimes it's a complex Mm. I remember when I entered in this institute, the old professor were working here. When they used to <coughs> inoculate, for instance, purified uh, clostridium for to prevent clostridiosis in cattle or sheep and goats, they 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 normally didn't didn't work. When they used to mix with a kind of adjuvant full of other you know, toxin from other bacteria. It was very effective. <laughs> so I, it was very empiric way in the time, <laughs> but maybe in reality, they, they need more factors to be, uh, to stimulate better, you know, the immune uh, system of, uh, but I believe uh, because uh, at least uh, it's, uh, it's from the chemical point of view is the best way to disrupt the mycoplasma membrane and to show to, to the immunity uh, of the of the ruminants, it should be the, the best way. Uh, I am very curious to know how they manage and which kind of saponin they are utilizing at the moment for their vaccine. Eventually, this is uh, we can uh, exchange information. To do that. I, I also would like to add a little comments in the end, you know, we, we may say, Robin, final remarks, you know, final remarks, you know. Of course, in the age of the fighting against uh, antimicrobial, antimicrobial resistance, vaccines are the, the really, the, the, the most important tools we can, uh, we can apply. Especially now, the big challenge for uh, the, the veterinary professionals it's how to, uh, you know, how to, you know, fight against this kind of disease. Uh, because here we have some outbreaks of mycoplasma bovis, but in reality, in in my region, they 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 keep mainly sheep and goats. So the big problem is contagious galaxia by mycoplasma galatia and by mycoplasma mycoides capri, both these pathogens. So in reality, they never get out. Uh, we, I am following outbreaks uh, since uh, 10 years, yeah, collecting sample 
you know, any, any lactation period and checking antibodies and checking excretion in the milk and blah, blah. And actually there is always a small percentage excreting the pathogen in the environment. So it means either the vaccine and the antibiotics maybe when they treat the clinical, the few clinical dose normally don't don't always sterilize anyone. So uh, th therefore we have still a lot uh, to be done, you know, uh, in, in the research, the university to study much more active and efficient vaccine to you know sterilize animals and also in the other field to understand and to to manage best bio safety measures in the farm to stop you know to stop the infection because also uh, just to you know to speak but one of those farms the first one with the the farm with 150 cows, he is, he is going to the psychologist. He is going, he is saying to us, I, I want to suicide myself because he can't go out from this problem. Can't go out, like probably some farms in, in New Zealand or Canada when once mycoplasma bovis center, no way to, to uh, eradicate. So, and uh, so I believe uh, we have to focus even more to this problem. We have to improve the quality of vaccine and of course the quality of management and we have to train veterinary farm, veterinary people to do uh, before laboratory tests to avoid movement of animal uh, which can carry the, the risk. Thank you, Dr. Guido. Okay, if there's uh, no more questions, I want to thank all the doctors for their valuable answers. Thank you all. The, thank you for all. Uh, there is a question. If there is no more question for Dr. Robin, there is a question. Uh, I'm sorry for mispronouncing the name. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, Yevgenia Balshik asks, uh, which methods for fighting cattle mycoplasmosis are most widely used in Turkey. I want to address this question to Muhammad Karahan. Muhammad Karahan, could you answer the question? Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is Muhammad Karahan. I am working in uh, Istanbul Pendik Veterinary Control Institute, uh, Mycoplasma Reference Laboratory. First of all, uh, many thanks for Guido and Robin for excellent presentation. Uh, only CBPP notable uh, mycoplasma diseases in Turkish ministry control programs. So special samples, uh, animal samples and imported animal samples come to regional institute and regional institutes uh, sent us if suspecting sam samples for confirmation. Actually, uh, CBPP has never been seen in our country. If it's uh, seen, we will use OIE, is uh, met uh, methods, uh, prevention and control methods, uh, like uh, uh, disinfection, quarantine, and uh, other, we don't have any control program for mycoplasma, bovis, and other ruminant mycoplasmosis. Uh, that's all. I hope it is enough for answer. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. If there is more questions, I want to ask other uh, other doctors to their questions. Is there any question? Okay. If there is no more questions, I will give the speech to uh, Dr. Özlü Güzel to make a closing speech. Oh, thank you so much, Fatma. Um, I would like to first of all thank to Guido and. Uh, Robin for accepting our invitation and spent their time, valuable their time with us. And I actually, to be honest, I learned so many things from you all. Maybe if I, if I have time to spend with you in UK, in Italy, that would be great for me actually. But um, I don't know what will happen in the future. So uh, I also would like to thank 
Dr. Umit because uh, he she tried she makes this uh, webinar possibility for us and also I would like to thank um, Dr. Osman or or Erganish because uh, he spent his valuable time and he is here. This is very honor for me. And I also would like to thank for the other listener and who joined this webinar and staying with us uh, until the, that time. And I also would like to thank Tubitak because Tubitak gave this chance to us. We came together and that is uh, all I have today. So uh, I would like to keep in touch with you all <laughs> in the future. Uh, I am sure I will uh, send some email questions so that is why thank you so much for now. We thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's a real, real pleasure to, to speak to my Turkish colleagues again. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. And welcome in England, in Italy, whenever you like. It's, uh, it will be a pleasure also with Robin. We can exchange eventual, eventual facilities, maybe your facility or my facility, we can share some uh, experience or some laboratory activity to improve our studies. Thank you very much. Thank you. That will be great. Yeah, thanks so much. OK. We would like to thank all the participants and valuable invited speakers and hope to see you in all the future events. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye.